Hello everyone, welcome into another stream. So yesterday we started off with watching Smoketown's Glomide Queen video and we also finished it because it was a long one. And today we also have another long video to look at. It will be Hawkshaw's video about the color theory of Elden Ring. So I think I've seen maybe one or two videos of uh, Hawkshaw's Dark Souls lore stuff, but overall I'm not super familiar with his channel and this will be my first foray into his Elden Ring coverage. I have also released a color theory video sort of uh, talking about the gold and silver aspects in The Lands Between. So I, I'm curious if Hawkshaw is going to look at the other colors like uh, red for invaders and blue and stuff like that. So uh, eagerly looking forward to this one. And everybody, welcome back into the stream. Boxerwing1970, Sterquilinus, uh, Sketchy Deer, welcome in for the first time. Scowl Easy, nice to see you again. You're on time. And Mithotasuri, nice to see all of you. You've never made it through that color video, but you've heard it talked about a lot. Should be interesting. Okay. You watched the original vid a while ago and you're curious to hear my take? Okay, sweet. All right, without any further ado, let's go ahead and dive on into Elden Ring Secrets. Elden Ring Lore, The Color Theory of Elden Ring by Hawkshaw. What makes us tarnished? Being dull of color. The grace of gold blessed those who were first to serve it with most vivid coloration. Morgoth's sword, his sealed omen blood, is of shifting hue. The mirror helm reflects all light and colors. Marika is a carrier of the Elden Ring's vision. The greater will and its vassals are masters of the language of light. The fallen leaves tell a story, and it is a story of color. Color is so variable in our world, we didn't see what was in plain sight. In the lands between, color means much more, and once you start to see, you cannot stop. The mad taint of their newfound strength, the night of black knives, scarlet rot, Amber eggs, purple mariners, blood dynasties, omens, albanorix, giants, gods. Color takes center place wherever you look. It is also a focus in a sea of item descriptions. The word color is mentioned over and over, hue even more often. Reds, yellows, greens, purples, blues, every turn. <laughs> I thought I was bad about uh having too much visual information on this on this screen but no in all seriousness i do like the uh kind of uh balance that he's got going on i appreciate the uh coloring of the text to go along with this stuff it is just like a lot to take in if you are like super interested in stopping and reading everything own every hue color again and again and again like an obsession and more than anything an infatuation with gold Color, the pillars of the world of Elden Ring. Color is connected with all fundamental aspects of the lands between, and these connections are in a discoverable pattern. All things physical, energetic, informational, emotional, and spiritual in the Elden Ring world are paired with color, a unifying natural law. Not entirely related, but I just absolutely love the visuals for Moog's fight in general. Uh, it just between not only like his blood flame effects but just the ambience of the arena having like the burning effect going on in there as well it's just one of the most striking fights i think from soft has ever done and i also think it's ironically maybe one of the more fair elden ring bosses i think there is a little bit of a wonkiness with a few of the hitboxes and like managing avoiding his blood flame but overall um really getting away from the video right now so, also, Chapes, welcome into the stream. Nice to have you in. These base natures are what's being represented by the Elden Ring and these overlapping and intersecting runes. It gets a little bit more complicated than that, and we are going to get into it. Because if we understand color as a foundation, we can understand the entire lore of Elden Ring more clearly. So I think those are some pretty bold claims. I don't necessarily disagree because I do think there is a lot to go in with the color theory of things. So uh, let's see where it goes. How will we solve the mystery of color? It is clear alchemy was an influence. Color holds great importance in alchemy, as does gold. 
One famous alchemist gave us the splitting of colours and their relations. Blue borders green, which goes to yellow, to red, to purple, always moving through all possible shades. Another renowned scientist, James Clerk Maxwell, discovered that unlike the mixing of paints that artists use, the fundamental colours of light registered in the human eye are red, green, and blue. This gave him the insight to make the first colour photograph. Modern science has since proven the eye sensitivity to these three base colours, and it is the combinations of red, green, and blue that make every colour on the digital screens you're watching on. The system of additive colour, how the colours of light work, and how colours mix within light, that Maxwell is credited as having a founding role in, is the colour system we use here. While the paint colour relations are mostly similar to light colour relations, light colour mixing is additive, whereas paints are not. Sh I respect the distinction that uh, Hawkshaw is making here, and I'm curious as to where that's going. And I'm also curious if anybody in the chat is colorblind, and if you are, how has that affected your kind of like perception of maybe Elden Ring and or like the Lord that he's going to bring up in this video? Obviously, I might be asking that a little bit prematurely now, but I'm just curious if you guys have like any um, experiences that you can think of offhand where like you were surprised by something or so thought something was like something else. I don't know all colours at once in light, and you get white, unlike with paints. But it is light we deal with in the lands between, languages of light, and obsessions with what the eyes see. So we will use the true light colour relations in this analysis. How different perceptions of colour may change perceptions of reality, or reality itself, is worthy of speculation. With that, we will look at the lands between itself for evidence, since inspirations only go so far, and they are numerous and mix unpredictably. We have to begin as if we have woken up in the lands between, and use what we see around us to guide us. One difficulty is that there are other foundational laws in Elden Ring, which all mix and interfere. Another challenge is that colour isn't surface deep. We will have to isolate and simplify, we must find colours in basic and simple forms to understand. Then, we will earn a key to the complex lore. Colours are of course a useful tool in game design, used to form associations for the player and help the understandability of the world. This is why health, mana, and stamina are almost always depicted in games as red, blue, and green respectively. However, in Elden Ring, colours are far more important, featuring heavily in the lore and may in fact be an integral part of the rules of the world, rather than just a symptom of them. Eventually, we will understand why looking into another's eyes is so intimate, why we cannot dye our clothes another colour, why Radigan was ashamed of his hair, why Godfrey needed Sorosh to be a lord, why the Albanorix are so weak, why Melania's rot is scarlet, why Radan needs purple to keep his beloved horse, why the Frenzy Flame is yellow, why multicoloured is so vital, and understand the enigma of gold, the obsession that haunts madmen, nobles, and gods. All right, so with him mentioning like Melania having a scarlet rot and the importance of that, that just made me think about like the terms used in Japanese, and I just want to be clear, I'm not like super great with knowing the exact differences between like the shades of colors in English, let alone Japanese. So that might be something I need to pay a bit more attention to as I go forward looking at the lore and stuff. So anyway, hey, Evil Noah, welcome back to the stream. You like this one because you like colors? You've been waiting for it? Nice. <laughs> Louis Black, another uh, color-based comedian, I guess. That kind of sounded a lot worse out loud, didn't it? Anyway. <laughs> Okay. And uh, Scowleasy asked asked if there were rainbows in Elden Ring. I don't remember there being any depictions of the rainbows, but like I said in chat, I think there might be some incidental relation to a, a rainbow in the glowing stones. And maybe they mentioned there was an eighth color in there, although I might be thinking of Dark Souls. But yeah, typically not a lot of rainbows in a FromSoft game. All this color will lead out of the lands between past the stars, past the void, 
past even the gods. It leads beyond the creative work itself, to ourselves. After all, what if the lands between was an inner world? If this work of art is about what it feels to be human, body, mind and soul, then by learning about colour, we can learn about ourselves. And with learning and the grace of good fortune, we ourselves may rise to a future that is bathed in gold. Red, Crimson, Scarlet, Flame, Giants, Rot, and Blood. What is this colour's place in the rules of the world? What effects, magics, emotions is it connected with? For this first colour, we will take a deep dive into the proof in the world. As we move through the colours, we will not be so exhaustive, but those who are curious can search to find what we have. The first place to look is where we can find red's nature the clearest. Where is red in a pure form? An unmixed form, away from interference. In the simplest items we use most often. One of the first items is Flask of Crimson Tears. Tears, like all blessings from the Erd Tree, come in different colours but the red tears we couldn't live without. They replenish your HP, the vitality of your player character. We can also bring Torrent back to life with Crimson Tears. Other Crimson things in-game also affect HP. Crimson Amber Medallion, Red Scarabs, and Crimson Seeds, among others. Exalted Flash, treasured by heroes, is red meat in a medicinal solution of fiery red spices. It gives you the raw power of a beast, boosting your attack output. These things taken together make us think of bodily vitality. Red is needed to have a healthy body. Red is physical life. To interact with the physical world via physical means, you need red to restore that energy. Red is a colour our own world associates with health, youth and strength. In alchemy, red was believed to have these properties, and the coveted Philosopher's Stone, which gave eternal life, is depicted as a vivid crimson. Other items in Elden Ring link to this idea of vitality. The red feathered branch sword raises the power of your attacks. All types of invigorating meat, which are always pickled in a red medicinal solution, boost our robustness, which help against build-ups of frost and blood loss. Now, if a doctor in our world had matching coloured medicines for symptoms, you would choose to go to a different doctor. But in Elden Ring, it really works. The correlation between red and the same boosting effects even carries across cultures. Horn charms, made by the ancestral followers, a different society to the Erd Tree, come in many colours. The one that is pure red boosts robustness. Red has a true nature, and is a fundamental aspect of the world regardless of culture. What is the next red that is essential in Elden Ring? Essential, yet forbidden. Fire. Fire is diverse in Elden Ring, but in one way more than any other. Colour. Some flames are more like lightning. Some are lilac, some are ghostly, yellow, or black. All the flames have different attributes that once again match with colour. For now though... So yeah, I'm trying to look really quickly through some of the Japanese texts here to see if there is more correlation to that stuff. And I, I'm not trying to like deny anything that Hawkshaw is claiming. So it does seem like the equivalent of what they use for English, or the equivalent in English for what they use for red relating to HP is like crimson, and the localizers are pretty consistent about keeping crimson stuff in tune with health. So, and then uh, Scarlet Rot is just like normal red, like Akai, or Akai, whatever. Um, so yeah. I'll try to look at some of this stuff real quick, but he is going pretty fast and it's a little bit difficult to keep up and also pay attention to him. But yeah, um, good stuff so far. We will look at red fire. Red fire in Elden Ring is more like fire in our world. Intense, destructive, life-giving, essential, beautiful, tempting. Fire itself is not unlike bodily vitality, the warmth of a champion. Both carry increasing heat with increasing energy. After all, we seem to reanimate the ancestor spirits with fire. Both are hard to control as they increase in energy. 
But is red fire just as fire is red? Do, do you actually turn them into a physical form, or are they spirits? Both carry increasing heat with increasing energy, after all. So these dudes are already physical. Oh yeah, because these are the ones up top. Oh, he, he means like the the deer. For some reason I was thinking of like the followers rather than like the spirits. Okay. I was like, wait a second. <laughs> I thought you could like make the little spirit dudes down below like physical. Okay, okay, just me being silly. In Elder Scrolls Arena and Daggerfall, health was green, which feels so wrong. <laughs> Yeah, it is kind of funny how it became, I don't want to say like cross-cultural, cross, like a cross-gaming phenomenon. I can't think of the proper word, but like that red is life and like blue is mana or FP or whatever your game is working with. <laughs> you're, you're proud to have come up with this theory so much earlier than anyone else. Um, I think it, this is like one of those things where it's, it's a case of like independent discovery. Um, I, I obviously don't know exactly what your thoughts are, but I, I feel like a lot of this stuff was also present in the previous games and other games as well. Scalizzi says, in terms of health equals red because blood equals red, there are a couple of organisms that have blue blood like spiders and horseshoe crabs. Yeah, a lot of invertebrates lack hemoglobin if I'm remembering correctly, and they have hemocyanin instead. And I think that corresponds to how in Bloodborne, the kin type enemies don't bleed red. They bleed like a silvery whitish type fluid. That's not like pure white by any means. And I think it's because it's meant to show that they don't have like regular normal blood. And I think you could even compare that to Elden Ring, where if you hit the quote unquote bloodless enemies, which are... The Alabaster Lords, if I'm remembering correctly there. The Miranda Flowers, the Land Squirts. Pretty much the things that you need to summon with HP, like the Silver Mimics. If you attack them before they transform, they have silver blood. But after they transform, they have red blood. And part of my rationale for why that might be is because they might take in like the latent power of runes that they would drop if you kill them. And they use that to transform into humans and potentially get like red blood from it. But I digress. We seem to reanimate the ancestor spirits with fire. Both are hard to control as they increase in energy. But is red fire just as fire is red? Is color a true law of the world as opposed to a correlation? Let's look at the clues left in game. Starting with medicines, made often via cookbooks, we can isolate the ingredients. Many medicines are heart and liver based, another alchemy inspired rule. Eat liver to purify, hearts for vigor, and so on. You will gain the nature of what you eat. So too in Elden Ring. Of the various colored cured livers in game, one is called fireproof dried liver, and it is made with red medicinal solution. Another set of items with sets of colors are the Drake Talismans. They all have a different color, but the one that boosts fire damage negation is red. What about the Giants? They were the protectors of perhaps the most important fire in-game, the Giants Forge. Their fire nature is within them, their hair and eyes are red. So I just uh, looked at the fireproof dried liver just, you know, because I was a little bit curious. Uh, the, the Japanese kanji uses the exact same thing for like scarlet rod, unfortunately. So not that there's anything wrong with like the whole fireproof thing. I was just hoping that the developers might been might have been a little bit more intentional with their color choices, at least in Japanese, because there is a bit more like flexibility with what kanji you're using, even if... Um, it, it, it can be pronounced the same. Actually, let's just go ahead and pull up like G show. Um, let's look, type in red and this should be good enough. So this is, you know, the most basic character for red. But if you look at the other forms of it down here, oh, let's just go ahead and zoom in for you guys. If you look at the other forms of it right here, we have like red as crimson and scarlet. And I think, yeah, this I'm pretty sure this is what they were using for the like the flask of crimson tears then you have this red right here man and it also says it so i don't exactly know the the differences um just based off like these characters alone like i i do have like enough familiarity with them to be like oh yeah that one's red that one's like red but crimson and 
this one as well. So sometimes what I feel like I have to do to just kind of get like a better idea of like what that means in English is literally just do like a Google like picture search. And uh, sometimes to get rid of like the Chinese filters, I'll, uh, I'll add like a wa at the end of it. If my, all right, whatever. Um, and then I would like look up images, but oh, we have the Wiktionary. I guess it doesn't really show it. Anyway, not too important for his video. <laughs> Sorry to just get lost in the weeds there. Hey, Graceful Aurora, welcome back in. Uh, the Beast Blood item description gives the impression that those without red blood lack purpose or something. Yes, so I think that the idea is since blood carries gold in the beast blood that is where they get their will and their drive from and i think that's why we need to give uh like the silver mimic to your spirit ashes our hp to animate it because it cannot copy the will of the um user and so it's bloodless but it still needs like will to animate and move around and the same thing for like the land squirts and the soul jars of fortune Crackpot theory, the Graceless are literally colorblind and can't see gold since the color drained from their eyes. I don't know about that, but <laughs> as you said, Crackpot theory. All right, let's go back. This is not only as a representation. The fire and redness is truly within them, within the redness. We can find and hold this hair in our hands, giant's red braid, and it does fire damage. Fire Grease, of course, adds damage to a weapon, and is a vivid red. In our world, flammable grease or oil would be unlikely to follow these colour patterns, and it doesn't. But in Elden Ring, they always match, and across other coloured greases and their natures. Another notorious connection to red is blood. Blood is one of the engines of bodily vigour. In our world, eating red fruits wouldn't change your amount of blood or energy more than any other fruit. Yet, this is not what we find in Elden Ring. Consumables, when they are minimal and simplistic, once again follow a pattern. Staunching boluses, which alleviate impending blood loss, are red. Blood sorcery and blood magic are red. Blood grease is blood coloured, and blood will take us to more colour insights. What has strong blood? Rich, red blood. Beasts. Rich, untamed life is red. Vigorous life is deep red. Red is the beast, the animal, the flesh side of the human. Those deep red, or built of a red closer to wildness, exhibit beast-like transformations. Mog sprouts wings. Crucible Knights, who are infamously red-tinted, sprout horns, wings, and can use the power of many beasts. Interestingly enough, the Crucible Knights do not bleed, and I have no idea why. Like, I, I wish we could almost see, like, under their armor just to have some idea of what they are, but they don't bleed. Um, for what it's worth, I do have a very slight disagreement, although I feel like uh, Hawkshaw is probably speaking more like figuratively than like literally here. So, you know, take this with a grain of salt that I think the purity of life is kind of more draconic in nature with an asterisk. It, it's more like the more pure, the more raw that power of life, it's more likely that it's going to be closer in dragons to nature. I don't know if it's actually like a correlation versus causation thing. So just, you know, take that with a grain of salt. And I'm not entirely sure if it's it's really the idea. And no, I'll just, I'll just stop talking for there. Certain reds link these aspects together all at once. Red glintstone boosts thorn sorceries and lava sorceries, blood and fire. Blood flame is the same pairing of reds, and Mog's own blood bursts into flame in his boss fight. This also happened when he stood before the formless mother. His accursed blood erupted with fire. Blood and fire, both red, are not so different in nature. Red pairs up blood and heat in the trait of robustness. All the medicinal solutions that help robustness are red. What is the use of robustness? It helps prevent buildup of frost and blood loss. The giants are fire, and with such internal heat, they can survive cold regions. And with abundant vitality, blood loss is more manageable. 
If we join Mog's blood cult, we have a colour affect our own character. Our eyes glow red. It may also affect our view of the world, as a true follower's hunt for blood will become a mental obsession. This eye colour, just like the colour of armours, medicines, spells, has a causative connection in the game. It is a law of the world. It therefore is not a fashion option. We cannot change it at will. It would change the law of the game, fundamentally. Our eyes become our nature, which is paired in Elden Ring with colour. So one thought to go along with his claims about blood and life and all that is I wonder how he feels about the bloodless creatures like the uh, Alabaster Lords, the Land Squirts and all that. And not only them, but the Albinorics as well. So I'm, I'm figuring that he's going to get into them later, but I don't necessarily think that red should necessarily go hand in hand with blood. Although obviously... Like, there is a very strong connection, don't get me wrong. Yet, yeah, red doesn't only link with flame, blood, vitality, and so on. It also connects with harder to define things. Red has a shared quality with emotions, desires, sensations. Emotions are enormously important in Elden Ring. Nearly every ending is defined most by its emotion. Fear doubt, loneliness, grief, despair, mania. What emotions would be paired with red in Elden Ring? Emotions that are instinctive, primal, animal, beast-like emotions. These emotions are messy, hard to control, and ill-adapted to society. If colour was only colour, would a god be ashamed of his red hair? Beast blood is a rich red, and beasts are red natured. Those closer to animal emotions are closer to red emotions. They lack self control or regulation. They do not possess enough intelligence to understand or override their instinct. Beasts are aggressive. As well as the obvious signs of aggression in battle, they also roar when they fight, something very unique to beasts and those of a beast like nature. Rune bears roar, but so too do the red fire giants, Malaketh, or Garank, and Sarosh roars, until he is made silent. These types of nature are also useful. There are benefits, such as in battle. So, I totally get where he's going for with the roaring thing, although I feel like Sarosh might not be the best example, because the reason Godfrey chose Sarash to be like the beast region to him was because Sarash was very clearly associated with wisdom and was more or less essentially there to suppress Godfrey's bestial nature. And so maybe you could be make the argument that um, Sarash was drawing the bestial nature out of Godfrey and into himself. I don't really know about that, but just a little bit of a uh, nitpicking here on my part. Well, thou art of passing skill. Warrior blood must truly run in thy veins. After all, Radigan's glory burned as red as his hair, which leads us to another success story that drew from a well of red. Godfrey. He waged war all the way to become Elden Lord. His strength was unmatched, but these emotions had their time and place. And once Elden Lord, they no longer had a place in the capital. Sorry to pause it again, but we had a pretty good question in the chat. And let's pull this up. So we had the question of what kind of blood the Albanorix down in the Mogwin Dynasty Mausoleum bled. So they have red come out of them, like when they do their kind of blood crystal attacks here. But if I'm remembering correctly, and I might not be, they still bleed silver or... Maybe it is when you bleed them, like red blood comes out. I don't remember. I don't remember if I, I don't think I attacked him in this one. I think I have footage. Visceral blood. Okay. So, yeah, okay. They do have like both, but there is mostly like the white silver stuff that comes out of them. So we've got red over here on the left and then silver on the right. So they may have been infused with foreign blood, but are still... Like, technically, Alvin works. And I'm assuming I'm going to attack him, so let's see what blood comes out of him. So, mostly silver. 
So the visceral thing might be a mistake. I do remember with these ones, we have the same effect going on, like the first generation. So again, the visceral is red, and then we have silver following up. When you attack, they bleed silver. So is this more of a bug? It's kind of hard to say. I don't think the Alabaster Lords react the same way when you visceral them. Let me look if I have decent Alabaster Lord footage. No, that's just the entrance, but I have 1.0 playthrough. But it is funny that you can bleed them, but they don't like bleed. Okay, there we go. They don't bleed red. They have like the gray, green, silvery kind of quote unquote bloodless stuff. Or maybe that is red. Though it's, it's kind of hard to tell if it's like the Reduvia projectile. But anyway, the right regular stuff is still like gray. So maybe it's just a weird issue of that. I know Estelle can bleed red, which is really strange. But anyway, good question. Your idea that red equals id, blue equals ego, and gold equals super ego. I would probably need to think about that more and need a bit of a refresher on the difference between all three. It's been a long time since I've looked at that. Sarash might be a good example for Godfrey. If an actual lion can control himself, so can Godfrey. Hey, Elden Enthusiast, welcome back in. Uh, the in-game clock that moves when you pass the time seems to match Guth's uh, color theory, which you find interesting, as his philosophy of nature is based on dualism and pantheism. Would you mind going into a little more detail about that? Because I have no idea what that's really about. When we meet him, Godfrey maintains his lordly nature at first. He does not roar. His wildness contained in his bestial other half. This side of him, Sarosh, does roar but Godfrey talks to us relatively calmly before the fight. When he is pushed to his limit, however, Red has a place once more. He is then not content to have his beast, his aggressive side, held separate to him. He wants his bestial nature within him. He slays Sarosh, becoming his true nature once more. The deep red blood splashes all over him, staining him. Now, bestial and blood red, he roars, his breath and body so hot, they steam even in the air of the burning Erd tree. He charges us like a beast, using only his bare hands. So, another red emotion is aggression. A clear sign of this is the jellyfish. These young sisters change colour when they become aggressive, to red. Aggressive invaders have always been red. Blood boil aromatic, from a totally different sect to beasts, is rich red. Consuming it increases your damage output, but also your damage taken. At first this seems to be odd, until you read the description. It puts those who consume it into a frenzy, berserker-like beast-like. Linked to aggression is the competitive urge, ambition, the desire for power, dominance, possession. Competitive summon signs are red. The red effigy is competitive. The true Horolu fought for a crown, and on defeat tells us our strength deserves one. Brave, tarnished, thy strength befits a crown. We were told this lore before the game came out. Emboldened by the flame of ambition, someone must extinguish thy flame. Aggressive competitiveness that puts the person at risk cannot be unlocked without the red emotion of confidence, unquestioned by intellect. Innate and animal confidence is red. Godfrey doesn't worry about his enemies, he seeks them out. He even strips his own armour. This confidence doesn't question, it knows. And confidence brings us to another emotion, faith. What is knowing confidently, a knowing you feel within you, instinctively? What is knowing without thought, intellect, or proof? Faith. 
This deep feeling, or trust, we believe is a red emotion. It is confidence not only in oneself, but in things that are outer, fate, gods, magic. The Red Wolf of Radigan can use typical sorceries, but also red sorceries. Red sorceries draw on the power of faith. These spells- Hmm, I never thought about it that way. At first I was pretty skeptical of those claims, but I think it might be a bit of a stretch to say that faith is red alone. There might be more of a component that works with it, but I guess in the grander scheme of things, like all the crucible incantations scale with faith and you know that's more like red tinted gold but my initial reaction as to what color would have represented faith would have been gold if for no other reason than like all the obvious like earth tree connections but i'll probably need to think about that more honestly i was thinking uh there was also like the whole uh, trick question uh there is no color for faith because the prophets blindfold themselves because true faith you don't need to see the path ahead of you you just need to follow it but yeah Hey, Beans and Rice, welcome back into the stream. Yeah, he mentioned a lot of stuff with HP earlier. Spells are reviled by other sorcerers, who prefer intelligence as a casting source. Red Glintstone itself draws from faith, not intelligence. Radigan holds faith to this day, while Radigan's wife announces, Those blissful early days of blind belief are long past. He has faith to the very end. He tries to hammer the Elden Ring back together, and dies protecting it. So yeah, the more that I'm thinking about it, I'm not so sure that red is the best choice, because all of the Erdtree stuff scales with faith, obviously, and in the earliest times of the Erdtree, it was more tinted with red, and once Radigan incorporated intelligence with Golden Order Fundamentalism, I think that's the most likely time when red based incantations started to become more yellow based gold and we could probably compare that to the the ancient dragons incantations to the uh lane dell dragon cult incantations which are more yellow in nature but of course that it doesn't necessarily contain the entire spectrum of faith and colors in elden ring so there might be more here worth considering Faith is having a gut feeling. It is red. Unquestioned and unreasoned belief is the opposite to reason-based intelligence. Faith can also be a celebration of an object of faith, but we will get to those incantations later. One emotion, supposedly absent in the lands between, must be red. Lust. The urge to reproduce. It is primal and instinctive and it has waned since long ago. The food for boosting virility is an untreated bright red, blood and flesh. No bloodless meat for this effect. This can bring back the feelings those in the lands between had long ago. So again, that is technically cut content at this time. While it was in the 1.00 version of the game, the unpatched version of the game, it has been since amended. Probably with the day one patch, although I don't exactly know for sure. So I know Fextra had it wrong for a long time and they did finally fix it. <laughs> so yeah, take it that what you will. I don't necessarily know that if I would completely implicitly agree that Lust is red without more to back it up. Because we, we still could make the argument that Lust does exist to some extent and that Birth still exists to some extent. extent due to Raya's birth after Rykard was devoured by the Great Serpent. Although, you might be able to make the arguments that since she's a snake person, she came from an egg and not the typical form of, like, a lustful union would create a child in? I don't know. Um, anyway, yeah. Elden Enthusiast said he claimed that colors are a mixture of light and darkness. His views were heavily influenced by medieval magic and mysticism. He connected triangles and colors inscribed in his color hexagon, where purple is considered to be an unnatural color. Since the extreme reds and blues do not touch, the shades of purple that can be obtained are thus unnatural to Guth. Okay. I'll need to like look into that. And um, one other thing that I kind of wonder about in relation to like Elden Ring and just like, you know, the color theories in general is like the ancient 
I guess maybe not ancient, but um, like the medieval ideas of like the humors and blood colors. I know there's a lot of stuff relating to uh, colors and like Chinese. Um, I, I, what's it called? Like, I don't want to say like Zodiac, but it, it's kind of like a similar idea relating to like Feng Shui and, and Taoism. Occultism? No, I, I can't think of the term, but like relating certain ideas to certain metals and like colors to like wood water fire just metal in general that kind of thing anyway i i am curious where the intersection between east and west goes with a lot of like the more nebulous theories like color theory in elden ring like how much comes from george r, r. martin and or his research into like more european styled mythologies Versus Miyazaki's just culturally relevant Eastern religion type stuff. And of course, Miyazaki's fascination with the West in general. Um, I, it really does have a lot of unresolved questions for me, at least. Mysticism? Alchemy. Yeah, esotericism. Something along those lines. Also, welcome back to the stream, Sarcastic. Or animal nature. But now, things red have faded, and red emotions have gone the way of the Crucible Knights. Once useful and essential, the knights, coloured a red of the past, represent that mix of life and vitality. Now, red is looked down upon, and viewed as uncultured. Urges are repressed or simply cease to be, as society develops beyond their need. These red emotions form a pattern, they go against civilization. Aggression, ruthless competitive desire, anger, physical power, raw, blind confidence, these are not so useful in developed society. To quote Elden Ring's own assessment in Ruler's Mask, such a mask illustrates the qualities of an ideal lord, chiefly wise and possessing a certain defanged geniality. Red is certainly not defanged, and a lord is a representation of high society. Red emotions will get you in trouble if left unchecked. Those in society show their disregard for red with their clothes. It is a symbol of wildness, just as vestiges of the crucible are. Both are now increasingly disdained as an impurity as civilization has advanced. Well, I don't entirely disagree. I do wonder where Hawkshaw plays or places uh, Radon and Rikard's adoration of Radigan's redlocks that are symbolized in their uh, respective knights' armor. So the Gelmir armor knights have the red feather in their helmet, and the red manes are like they love the color red because it represents like the. Radon being a, a champion's cub and I don't remember what in their uniforms other than them just being red in general ties back into that off the top of my head you wonder if the vid will touch on how purple isn't a quote-unquote real color like the Elden enthusiast says red and blue don't actually blend there is no purple wavelength just combos of blue and red yeah I don't know um because purple is very interesting in Elden Ring because of its ties to sleep and ironically, in like 1.0, it was sort of kind of att attached to um, like going frenzied and becoming mad, but maybe not necessarily like the frenzied flame. There was a little bit more of an interplay between the frenzied flame stuff potentially and going mad and Mikola slash St. Trina stuff in the cut content, but obviously it got cut. So I digress. Those in the capital do not want to wear things that boost their bestial nature. Those who are exiled, however, are given clothes to wear that mark them as not fit for society. What is the colour of the exile robe? Red. The exile hood? Red. What is the colour of those exiled for heresy? A deep red. Sage hood is burgundy, and is literally evidence the wearer was driven from town. Red is a signal of a social reject. There are more mysterious uses of red. Why is the bolt that pierces Marika red? Is this because her physical body must be pinned down by red, 
by the bodily and physical nature of red? And what does the red of the two fingers tell us? What can we draw from the red that spills out after Rani slays her two fingers? Are the two fingers the physical aspect of something greater? The body of the greater will? Yet for all the risks of red, who could do without it? For many, a life without red wouldn't be worth living. In its most wild state, red is similar to, and in fact borders, another infamous colour. But first, red's opposite, blue. Blue in any Miyazaki game brings one thing to mind. Sorcery. The colour of sorceries are, like all of Elden Ring, very varied. Some sorceries are cast with faith, but almost all are cast with intelligence. These intelligent spells are ranges of blue. The first thought is that blue is the colour of the mind, of the intellect, and perhaps of the soul. Let's see if this intuition is right, and if so, what else does this colour do? What does this colour help, harm, and what are the blue emotions? Blue makes its appearance as one of the first items we find, Flask of Cerulean Tears. It replenishes your focus points. Focus is the engine of the intellect. Focus points are used to cast spells, activate skills, and much more. The navy blue hood, simply from its colour, increases mind. Magic Grease, Magic Scorpion, Blue Liver, Shimmering Hearts, all affect magic damage. All are blue. The blue Carrion Regal Scepter enhances Full Moon sorceries, and only those of the highest intelligence can wield it. It is all mental power. Blue. It's still on my like internal to do list to like actually go through all the conspectuses and like map out their colors and all the stuff relating to comets and stars and lunar stuff just to keep it straight in my mind, because I, I, I mean, I like know of them, but I don't exactly remember what correlates to what. So hopefully this video will help uh, just make some of that stuff a bit more distinguished in my mind. Who is the color of the mind, intellect, focus? The characters of the world confirm this. As they become more and more intellect focused, it reflects in their colors. Rani is no longer connected to her body, and she is permanently blue. She is also cold, with literal ice crystals under her hat. Lusat's brain has become almost inorganic, it is so far from red life. His new head has a deep blue within it. The mind's eye of Astol. A... I feel like that's a little bit cherry picked if you're just going to look at Lusat, but not also Azur. Although I think it's really ironic that Lusat is like the blue one. And Azure, like, isn't the Azure, aka blue one? But anyway, I digress. Star being is blue. Of course, the center of blue on the map is the Academy, surrounded by mists and waters, bathing in a night sky of the moon. Their robes are blue. Their spells are blue. The very mist and air around the Academy has a blue tint. Renala's robe is blue. The realm we are taken to in the boss fight is a realm of water, star, and moon. All of it, shades of blue. The nature of the place? Designed for intellectual growth and learning. The other heads of sorcery, the Karian royal family, even have their own shade, Karian blue. Their royal castle is lit with blue flame, with blue crystals growing in an air alive with blue sparks. Just as red is organic life, Blue is intellectual life, but inorganic. We see this clearly in the nature of Glintstone. Hard, inert, yet able to spring forth action and energy. The inert, non-living nature of the mind is shown by Lu Sat. As he descends more and more into a meditative, intellectual world, he becomes physically different, and less and less like typical animal life. Lu Sat's Glintstone crown says, this crown replaced Lusat's brain and skull altogether, and now, removed from his body, it is all but dead. 
it looks like a large, polished crystal. Lusat's manchettes tell us Lusat had reached a near inorganic state. Lusat leads the mind directly to crystallians, magical and mysterious beings with almost inorganic bodies, perhaps not entirely, but they wear red to boost this as much as they can. The crystallians are shades of blue. The inscrutable crystallians have their own culture, creator, and clearly a deep intelligence. The mind is the seat of thought, and therefore of character. Instincts are one thing, but when someone tries to self-control and choose their actions, we say it is their true selves, we may say it is their soul. The mind is therefore linked to spirit. Your true self is your soul. The soul can have different natures itself, but blue is intimately linked with the soul. Indeed, the blue primal glintstone of Selen states that this is, in essence, her soul. Rani died in body alone, and her soul lives on. Torrent is a spirit steed, and as we summon him, he appears in blue. If red was wild heat and energy, blue is cool and calm, and at extremes, cold and ice. If red is fire, blue is water, the sun to the moon. The cold is intimately connected with blue, and there is a pattern here too. As the nature becomes more cold, the blue becomes paler. Paler blue brings frost damage, and frost protection. Coldness and the mind combined gives logic. Diligent thought, free from emotion, blue is this cold mental operation. Instead of needing to be tamed like instinct, it is the taming energy, the guiding reason. This form of mind is used by sorcerers to unlock secrets about the world, new spells, the understanding of the stars, and of themselves. It is extremely powerful, if limited, just as instinct is. We see the power of this form of mind in-game. Rani is the epitome of it. If we attack her on first meeting, what happens? No indignation, no damaged pride. What hope is thou to profit? <clears throat> she doesn't even physically respond. There is I feel like that's a little bit unfair and going like a little bit beyond just like the color theory stuff. Obviously, I mean, these are his ideas. However, um, I think just trying to equate the soul purely to blue right now might be a little bit too forceful because we do have the unresolved questions of like the white spirits that he like lost over with the ghosts. Uh, Gold Free, I don't really count because he's most likely a manifestation of Morgoth's magic. But setting that aside, we also have the idea of being able to invade other worlds as Red Phantom is using technically like your spirit body to do that. And when you see like Dung Eater and the Round Table hold initially, that's his red spirit body as like a kind of host in, or like isn't a kind of invader. So there might be more to go along with red and blue to represent the soul or not necessarily just like blue alone. I do think it's a bit more nuanced and maybe part of the reason why the spirit ashes tend to be blue is because we tend to use FP to summon them. And nonetheless, I do think he does bring up a lot of interesting points here that I kind of agree with in terms of blue's potential to like potentially tame others in terms of the puppets around Rey Lucaria Liernia and in um, Fort Fraroth to the very eastern edge of Kaled. They all have like blue eyes, but yeah, th there's just a couple other things that I don't think fully aligns with blue equals spirit like completely, but there is a lot of like good stuff in here too, not to like just take away everything from him here. All right, Elden Enthusiast, thanks again for dropping by and you have a good night. You just noticed the fetus shape in Selen's Primal Glenstone? Yeah, they do a crazy amount of attention to details in these games. And yeah, the other thing with like the blue and stuff goes back to like just uh, how there is green glenstone to consider as well. There's even uh, the red glenstone, which he did mention earlier. So it's not just that, although he does think like red is more affiliated with faith, which I'll need to think about more as well. There's no logical reason to nothing to gain by it. 
She dissolves this temporary spiritual body into the air in a shimmer of blue. Even if we tried to kill her after being her loyal ally, after placing an engagement ring on her finger and swearing to become her consort, how does she respond? No rage or aggression. What hope is thou to profit? <clears throat> she asks us why we would do this, a logical question, then reflects on her behaviour and how she may have caused her own downfall. <sighs> so this is the measure of my lord. Perhaps it is precisely what I deserve, for surrendering myself to delusion. The blueness of these cold, logical forms of mind, and Rani's behaviour may lead us to believe there are no blue emotions, but this is not true. They exist, they are just drastically different to red ones. What emotions might blue feel? What emotions come with coldness? With logic? Rani tells us when talking about her planned form of order. She will take us into fear, doubt, and loneliness. Blue emotions include all of these. A rational mind that analyses and looks at evidence will always carry doubt. The world is full of the unknown, of chaos and randomness. A blue mind will think about the limitations of knowledge, how knowledge can be an illusion. Even Gideon, the all-knowing, has gaps in knowledge and makes mistakes. A blue mind doubts. Fear comes next, and directly from doubt. It is a fear of the unknown, not the known. The fearless are usually those who don't know enough, the red and foolishly confident. So going back to the Rani stuff, I do feel like some of the ideas of her, like, demeaning or doubting herself for having, or debasing herself for, like, having a, a lord that would attack her, just kind of speaks more about her character than just being, like, more blue and cold and more like logic filled because we do have Selavus who tells us that she's like a kind gentle girl at heart despite like having cold dead eyes although that's like a little bit of a flowery localization there not that big of a deal in terms of like the dead eye angle but um anyway there is the chance that Ronnie can attack the player if he, if the Tarnish chooses to side with Solovis and try to make her a puppet, <laughs> if, if you keep talking to her, she will just like one shot the Tarnished. So she isn't like completely emotionless and passive. Although to be fair, like what she says is very tempered and calculated, which might speak more to his uh, thought here. I think it might just be like a little bit of a loss that he didn't go and cover that angle perhaps. Loneliness for a cold rational mind is almost a guarantee less animal, less instinctive, less social, more introspective, wanting to understand more than feel. Loneliness is a complete match with blue. The mind struggles to connect with others as easily as the body can, and mental pursuits have their costs. Many of the sorcerers we find in-game have receded into thought so deeply they have stopped being social entirely. They do not even talk to us. Disconnected sorcerers are spread out across the world, and are quite content in their solitude. Other blue emotions are more positive. Calmness, ease in one's own company, pleasure in learning and erudition, self-awareness. It may not sound exciting, but it can do very well, which is why blue has a premier place in society. Blue is the colour of the effective members of developed society. Bestial constitution informs us of society's shift to blue. Having gained intelligence, the beasts must have felt how their wildness slipped away as civilization took hold. It is not chaotic like the red of the animal. It does what should be done. It self-controls for success. All right, I'm not entirely sure where he's pulling the blue from that, and I am starting to have more issues with these claims, which I feel are just kind of more like... Uh, how do I say this? Like, they're more statements that are just like... Ideas rather than like things that are like backed up more concretely. 
I'm struggling to phrase that properly. But yeah, like, um, we'll, we'll see if he, like, backs this up further. Blue is ever-present in the clothes of those in society to display this commitment to self-control for the greater good. What does Godfrey, the Lord, wear, not Horalu? Yeah, as Jabo says, it seems like it's uh, an attempt to convince by repetition. That's kind of the feeling that I'm getting. Like, he's making statements definitively, but they kind of feel more like non sequiturs, where, like, the conclusion comes first, but the supporting evidence is circular and just kind of goes to feed in the conclusion rather than like properly supporting it if that makes sense but nonetheless i still like a lot of these observations i just i'm just not fully on board so far blue not only godfrey lords and royals of all kinds all wear blue royalty following the guidance of grace serving the greater good on missions away from the capital wear a navy hood, unlike the exile Red Hood, marking them as social outcasts. Royals display their respect of society and their adaptation to it. Officials' attire is blue, worn by magisterial officers to carry out grim but necessary tasks that drive the wheels of mankind. Devotion to society is what is on display with these robes, Okay, I just looked at the navy hood. Oh, okay, okay, hold on. Where's the other hood? Crimson hood? So both are described as being worn by expatriated royalty, so I'm not entirely sure that his claim is correct here. Those such clothes were gifted. Hold on, did he actually have the um, descriptions up here? Offices. So it doesn't look like he has the uh, Crimson Hood's description. But what choice did they have having seen the Guidance of Grace versus... Yeah, this is just kind of like... I feel like he's just kind of ignoring the Red Hood and making a statement about the blue one. Maybe there's something else to back this up, but I'm, I'm not so sure that this claim is as solid as, as he's presenting it right now, which is unfortunate. Lords and royals of all kinds all wear blue. Royalty following the guidance of grace, serving the greater good on missions away from the capital wear a navy hood, unlike the exile Red Hood, marking them as social outcasts. Royals display their respect of society and their adaptation to it. Officials' attire is blue, worn by magisterial officers to carry out grim but necessary tasks that drive the wheels of mankind. Devotion to society is what is on display with these robes. Blue's true nature once again extends to other cultures. Ruler's robe states, luxurious robe worn by lords in a smaller nation. Its fine blue mantle serves to prove its wearer's status. Blue proves status in society. Even the Mogwin nobles, despite blood being the foundation of their dynasty, wear blue. Red would only prove one's strength and dominance in animalistic hierarchies. Societal status is gained another way, with a blue mind and blue approach. Returning to God- Alright, I kind of get where he's going for with that, but there might be other explanations as to why blue would denote more royalty. And yeah. Uh, Hawkshaw makes some cool videos, but he lacks awareness of which claims are strongly supported and which are random conclusions he feels strongly about. Maybe. If so, that's unfortunate. Scowleasy says, blue equals status, probably because it's expensive to make? Yeah, maybe. He just blew your mind. I appreciate that. Red gets sent away. But they were both, but I mean, in the very top of the descriptions, they're both said to have been worn by expatriated royalty, which means that they were kind of sent away. Okay, let's go back into the video. Godfrey and his blue attire, we will find perhaps the most beautiful illustration in-game of the natures of color, and how they can unlock the rules of this world. 
While Godfrey still controls his bestial nature, contained in Sirosh, a regal blue is on display. He wields his axe, symbolic of his vow to conduct himself as a lord. He is very calm. He treats us with courtesy when we meet him. He remarks how strong we must be to make it this far. He peacefully says goodbye to the corpse of his own son, the son we killed, and does not insult us. Only Sirosh roars. Godfrey is angry, but self-control keeps it within Sirosh. Finally, his self-control gives way, and Hora Lu emerges. He rips open Sirosh, releasing the deep red blood which spills all over him, making himself his true nature, predominantly red. The regal blue attire now hangs shredded, drenched in red blood, irrelevant, forgotten. He then says, I've given thee courtesy enough. Courtesy, the blue of a lord, is done with. With that, he roars. All these socially productive behaviours help to keep out one very dangerous thing, which leads us to yellow. Perhaps the most notorious colour in the world of Elden Ring, the colour of chaos. Yellow is the end of form or order of any kind. Beyond the animal wildness of red, beyond even extreme motion or manic thought, it is pure chaos. No society can endure, no emotion sustain, no being survive. All of these things are patterns which cannot exist in chaos. The mind cannot witness chaos without madness, the eye cannot even process it without destruction. Chaos, like all fundamental aspects of nature in the Elden Ring universe, is paired with a colour, yellow. The Frenzy Flame does not only look yellow, it is explicitly called yellow again and again in spell descriptions. In fact, all but one of the Frenzy spells mention the specific quality of yellow, and the one exception doesn't even summon the flame. As well as yellowness being explicit to its nature, so is chaos. The Lord of the Flame of Frenzy is called the Lord of Chaos. Chaos and yellow pair up throughout the game. Things that possess aspects of chaos take the colour yellow, with only certain things going a deep yellow. The pattern is very consistent, from yellow boluses, eye of yellow grown in frenzy afflicted lands, to the Frenzy Flame Stone, which swaps yellow in place of the gold of its gentler cousin. Even our eyes, when we have accepted the flame, turn a vivid yellow, reflecting the chaos within us, the chaos which will eventually consume us. So what is chaos? In typical language, it is complete disorder and confusion. In science, it is more about total unpredictability. Disorder, of course, contrasts with order. It is therefore a fundamental aspect of the world. It may be a lie, but Shabriri says, Shabriri is chaos incarnate. I cannot die. <laughs> Whether or not Shabriri can be destroyed, chaos certainly cannot be. It is the bottom on a scale of order, or a peak on the scale of chaos. Order is structure, patterns, divisions. Chaos is its opposite. It cannot be destroyed any more than you can permanently destroy a temperature. However, this does not mean that chaos doesn't have a very real effect on anything non-chaotic. Shabriri wishes for the yellow flame to incinerate all that divides and distinguishes. Yellow is disordered, but yellow has an effect on other things too like acid changes what it comes into contact with. It brings things to chaos. It burns up order. Carle's cut dialogue states that a frenzied flame can melt away the curses, suffering and despair, and the order entire. The reverse is true. Order is destructive to chaos. Look at how the nomads are locked away, sealed and rejected by order. Look how thick, heavy doors, a simple physical order, seal the three fingers. Look how the flame of frenzy decays to red once we cast. 
In a domain of non-chaos, it becomes its red, less chaotic neighbour, before fading away. Neither order or chaos can survive in an environment which is overwhelmingly the opposite. Shabriri has been working on his plan for a long, long time. May chaos... the world. But until our influence, the Frenzy Flame is still so irrelevant it can be totally missed in a playthrough. It is not much easier being an anarchist than someone trying to progress order in society. To move the scale long term is an enormous challenge. Hard to believe? Imagine adding as much chaos as you could to the world. How long would one last before being locked up, or saying farewell to the world oneself? The damage chaos does to the order that accepts it is obvious. Our yellow eyes will eventually become yellow embers, burst and broken from suffering the flame of chaos. Simply seeing the dazzling glare of frenzy for too long is too much for the order of our eyes. The merchants suffer. The Three Fingers seems injured, or heavily fatigued, but it may not be from outside influences. It is just the cost of holding chaos within it. I think one thing to note about like yellow and chaos incarnate and all that stuff is the kind of irony in that to become the Lord of Frenzied Flame, you are still kind of instantiating a form of order, even if that order is essentially the incineration of everything that's alive or dead in terms of like spirits and stuff like that. So chaos in and of itself might be chaotic to itself, I guess, if that makes sense. But moving away from like the whole game idea of chaos in terms of like being a metaphysical force, Chaos is kind of a lie in terms of reality. Of course, like Newtonian uh, physics, like for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So if something appears disordered at first, I think that more or less speaks to a misunderstanding of the events that led to that perception of chaos. But of course, that's a very different thing than what might be going on in Elden Ring. But I couldn't really just like keep that bottled up for, for too much longer. Boris, nice to see you again. And Chadwick, I don't remember if I welcomed you back into the stream. Had a busy week? Nice. Well, not so nice. Happy Friday. Chaos only loses to Entropy, and even then, it's just, just so dispersed it has no power. Yeah, I feel like Chaos is just more of a perspective thing than like a, a, a literal thing. So that makes it um, kind of interesting to consider within the confines of Elden Ring when, you know, like magic doesn't exactly follow the laws of Newtonian physics, you know? Uh, Sterquilinus says, there cannot be order without a society, you think? There is no life. But also quantum physics is about probabilities, probabilities so chaos is definitely real. I mean, I would disagree with that idea. I mean, that's probably just more of a label than like what I would call to be like literal chaos. Like, to me, chaos would be like the, the breaking of physics or mathematics in such a way that it destroys order. But of course, that's a very specific viewpoint that I'm taking right now. And anyway, yeah. Finally, it burns up. Even channeling chaos is not free. It means damage to anything with order. We ourselves are a lot of order, and the pain we feel casting a frenzy spell is obvious. Even just the sight of the Flame of Frenzy drives the enemy, and ourselves, mad. All this summoning time and agony merely to summon Frenzy in the most random and inaccurate way. Frenzy Burst is one exception. This spell manages to direct Chaos in a generally straight direction, yet the Frenzy Flame shows its nature as it flies, wildly spiralling as it rebels against this control. The spell's description matches our understanding of Frenzy. In times past, every single person who attempted to control the Flame of Frenzy succumbed to madness after a desperate internal struggle. This incantation is testament to a meagre victory. What else is Yellow in game, and does it fit with the fundamental nature of chaos? There is one thing we can encounter at random in the plains as we ride. Lightning. Randomness is a clue. Just like the Flame of Frenzy, it bursts forth, chaotically and seemingly unpredictably. The match between yellow and lightning is more than just the colour of lightning. If we pickle liver in a yellow medicinal solution, 
it boosts lightning damage negation. Fulgur Bloom itself is yellow. Lightning Grease is a bright yellow. So lightning has a yellow nature, a chaotic, sudden, unpredictable nature. Of course, lightning isn't always yellow, which may hint to how exactly lightning works. And I'm a little bit curious as to what you guys feel about his claims that lightning is inherently chaotic. I can get that from like, you know, a non-scientific perspective, but I mean, the laws of like magnetism and electricity are pretty well understood. And so that we can say like lightning isn't necessarily chaotic, but of course, like predicting things is a very different uh, beast altogether. Jagged. If it's magic lightning, sure. Okay, very, very well. It's super hard to predict. Okay. Yeah, no, I know about like the Maxwell Demon Thought Experiment, but yeah, by my logic, nothing is chaotic. Pretty much, that is kind of the argument. I, I believe that we live in a in an ordered universe, and we might not just have a perfect understanding of things. So things like quantum mechanics might appear disordered, but I mean, we certainly do have enough of an understanding where we can apply quantum mechanics to things like quantum computing. And of course that just might speak to my ignorance of the subject and they could be like two completely different schools or applications of a school of thought and all that. But anyway, if things were more fundamentally chaotic, things would break down. But at the very least, we do have some semblance of order, which seems to govern the inner workings of the universe. Beans and Rice says, Lightning takes all paths at once until it finds a preferred path, and then it follows just that path. Maybe that's chaotic? Maybe. I don't know. I mean, I understand where he's coming from, and of course, like, Lightning is sort of chaotic just because of its unpredictable nature, but I feel like chaos is a little bit different from being unpredictable, if that makes sense. I don't know. But aside from that, at least in Elden Ring, you can like summon lightning into specific shapes. So that is does seem to be a little bit less chaotic to me than like the frenzied flame stuff. Of course, like, you know, there's always the confines of how each incantation works, but there's a certain kind of loss of control that's implied with the frenzied flame, whereas there does seem to be more like literal control over the like lightning incantations and the lance axes glaive and stuff like that. Slow mo guys did a video with the electro boom. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you can narrow the predictability of it. In game, it may just be that this is the purest example of red, and red is vigor, life, intensity, not chaos, just energy and motion. You think chaos and anarchy are designed to be. This damn heart and. Uh, end? End? Can't. Anyway. An old order or way of or way of things and giving them to new? I'm uh, sorry, Noah, your comments. I don't understand it right now. So going back to the video. What brings it into existence? If they exist, yellow emotions would be quite a thing to feel. What do we feel when our inner order is troubled by yellow? Pure yellow is beyond emotion, but we can be riddled with chaos before we disappear, and so too can emotions. The simplest emotions are the unavoidable ones. Ravaged by internal chaos, one emotion is inevitable. Fatigue. Have you noticed that all the nomadic merchants are seated? When Kale or an aggressed merchant does stand, they have very hunched shoulders. They slouch even more than the use of their cane requires. As skinny as his donkey, Kale helps to hold up his own coat with one arm. The posture is of someone suffering from fatigue reminiscent of a teenager. Villagers of the Frenzied Village are brought to their knees by the Frenzy. The Three Fingers is too alien to be certain, but it seems to be exhausted. In comparison, even the old Two Fingers, described repeatedly as having lost all vigour, stands upright and present until death. Posture is very carefully designed in Elden Ring. Raya is snake-like, Patches squats, those who are learning discipline or lack discipline sit slouching or lie down. Millicent lies down when suffering from rot, then stands tall and elegant as a swordmaster once revived. 
Physical posture is chosen with care, and the merchants have been given this gait by design. It is not only when using their canes, but also when they sit that they hunch over. Others such as Bernal sit straight upright despite a ton of steel armor. Hayata, as blind as the merchants, I feel like that last example, especially with the steel armor, doesn't make as much sense because if you actually have on like literal body armor, it makes it a lot harder to bend because it's it's not malleable. Um, but anyway, going back to the whole crouching stuff, like I don't necessarily disagree with all of these observations, but I don't know how relevant they are. And it might be right now ignoring like the terrible posture of like the finger reader crones. I don't know exactly where he's going with this entirely yet, but that's just kind of one thing that stood out to my mind as a potential contradiction here so far, but there might be more to it. Right, despite a ton of steel armor. Hayata, as blind as the merchants, stands tall when she has not yet taken the flame of frenzy within her. Fatigue will be felt by those who harbor yellow, even if it itself is not directly yellow. Fatigue correlates heavily with one thing that is certainly yellow, creativity. Thops, despite being ill-disciplined at school, a blunt stone who can't sit upright, creates something worthy of a new conspectus. Millicent and others who are weakened and exhausted by rot, yet have a creative fire within them. It exhausts them as it burns them up, yet it is a great driving force. Roderica has a remarkable gift. The merchants are enterprising, musically talented, devise solutions to blindness, and have a remarkable fashion sense. Yellow is creative because it doesn't respect any borders. It doesn't have any filters or rules. It is unpredictable. So going back to the fatigue thing, my initial impression would be that it would be more related to purple because purple is the color of sleep. But I guess technically you could say the nomadic merchants aren't really sleeping, although I think he said that they were or some of them were. Um, anyway, yeah, going back to this. Could the world survive without some chaos? Could a lands between flourish if only two fingers had their way? Or would no chaos be as destructive? has no order. All creativity must have some yellow in it, but pure yellow is extreme creativity. Delinked from order, the mind whirls about manically. It might discover anything, but this yellow creativity is once again so manic it is damaging to the mind. No sooner is an idea had before another crowds it out. Creativity beyond all function, beyond all capture, all memory, all use, a living torment of possibilities. But great creativity usually doesn't come without some madness. The thumb is a fitting example. It is the most important and creative part of the hand, but it is creative because it is so much more unhinged. Shabriri gives us the next emotion. And incinerate all that divides and distinguishes. The yellow emotion of rebellion. Yellow doesn't want to be controlled. Yellow doesn't want to follow rules. Red might be willful, but yellow will rebel even if it is against its own interests to do so. Rebellion is innate to it. It will not be contained. Shabriri himself is reviled, yet he does not let the opinions of others constrain his behavior. How are the yellow materials that make lightning described? Fulminating. What a profoundly odd and specific word for a Japanese game. Fulminating can mean to explode violently, or flash like lightning, but this is a literary definition. Its primary definition means to express vehement protest. Yellow is a constant revolution against order. Shabriri laughs at our judgment. Nomadic merchants were cast out for heretical beliefs, only for them to summon the flame of frenzy. To this day, they live outside of society, nomads who live under their own rules. Lightning itself is willful and hard to direct. Even the masters of lightning receive heavy lightning damage. Perhaps they are only channelers of it, and not rulers. How does the flame of frenzy itself behave when we try to channel it? it All right, so I did double check the uh, Japanese for Folger Bloom, and it's essentially just like lightning flower. 
And I remember either I looked up Folger Bloom's um, etymology for Folger or somebody else did a long time ago. But I think it, it's just kind of like really related to lightning. So I think it's more of like a localization than anything. But anyway, I, I don't really think that's too important. I just uh, tend to not be able to leave that kind of thing alone. Uh, hey, Paul, welcome back to the stream. Do I have Tarnished Archaeologist video about the two fingers and the three fingers in my playlist? That one's probably your favorite Elden Ring lore video. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head. I do believe my playlist is public, so you could probably see it there. And if not, feel free to like comment it either in like the, the video comments or on my Discord channel feedback section, and I will include it to the playlist at some point. Folger is from Latin. Okay, thank you, Scalizzi. Uh, Chad would like to touch slightly that Japanese body language is a bit different from Western nonverbal communication. That's true too, although I don't exactly know how relevant some of the, that would be to like this conversation. There is perhaps some merit to the posture talk, but you're not sure it goes beyond simple characterization. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel. Like he might be making good points, but I'm not entirely sure if what was intended is falls in line exactly with what uh, Hawkshaw is positing, positing all the time, but I don't really know. I still think these are, are interesting observations, but again, uh, not something that I am inherently in agreement with. Rides furiously against direction. The sheer time to summon it is something any Frenzy Flame spellcaster has suffered. A further example of the rebellious nature of Frenzy is, counterintuitively, the spell Gelmir's Fury. It looks uncannily like the behaviour of the Flame of Frenzy. Why? Because both are physically rebelling. Neither want to be summoned. Gelmir's Fury is held to represent the fury of the volcano Gelmir itself. However, the arrogance of attempting to harness it is solely that of men and serpents. It is not the place of men and serpents to try and tame a volcano. So, the magma bursts chaotically from the ground, rebellious, frenzy-like. Why did he say yellow was related to, to Topes other than just like he thought that was the color of creativity? Because Topes' barrier is, is like green and stuff, right? I don't want to like go back too far. I'm just... Like, I get where he's coming from with creativity and rebellion is, is fine enough, I don't know. I'm just curious as to like what where he's going to uh, distinguish yellow from gold. I just, I just saw Topes for a, a second ago. Oh, well, I guess I'm not going to worry about it. Okay, let, let's just go on. Oh, because he was hunched over. Ooh, yeah, that's kind of a stretch for me. <laughs> thanks, thanks, though, sarcastic. Green is mixed with yellow and blue. Is that the pigment thing, or is that the actual like? shades of light because i don't remember the difference with how they all mixed but i think that's kind of a fair comment perhaps but does he talk about green later on he just says multicolored yeah i guess he doesn't really talk about green okay <laughs> you also don't remember? All right, it's, it's all good. We'll figure it out. Maybe. The most heavily referenced yellow emotion is madness. This may be more what happens with chaotic thoughts and emotions. A lack of inner order so extreme your mind breaks down. If all thoughts and emotions can never rest or settle, they cannot be put into action, or even remembered effectively. How can one sleep with a chaotic mind? How can one resist the... That line about how can one sleep with a chaotic mind? This feels like a Wario wear, like background track. It's really distracting me. The tides of euphoria, paranoia, hysteria. So in or, or like somebody's just stepping on a floor filled with like rubber ducks or something. Intense, it corrodes our mind to madness. A final relatable emotion is the glee taken in chaos. A desire and joy for surprise. Mess, unpredictability. Ah, oh, may chaos take the world. May chaos take the world. 
Many experience a love of chaos while young. If you can feel what we're talking about, you might have some frenzy in you. Just like inner chaos taken too far can drive you mad, outer chaos taken too far leads inevitably to self-destruction. And yet, there is nothing else like it. What about Yellow's place in society? Practically speaking, it has none. Aside from the odd flash of creativity that might be viewed as acceptable, Yellow isn't welcome. Even then, society doesn't want creatives coming and disrupting the hierarchy. Rebellion doesn't work well in society. Rules must be followed, not only at the large scale, law, religion, or customs, but at the smaller, social scale. Nomads are solitary when they aren't rounded up and locked away. Yellow isn't good at social niceties and rules of courtesy. Kale himself says, I've always preferred my own company to that of other people's. On top of that, Kale doesn't hold back the truth. Ah, then you met Blythe, did you? Wonderful. I'm glad I pointed you in his direction. He's boorish, blunt, and couldn't find his nose with both hands. But he's a good egg. I think the two of you are sure to find the best in one another. Calling Blythe a good egg doesn't undo the insult, but Yellow doesn't play the courtesy game. The kit costs a bundle, and I admit I do take my cut. But the important thing is that you survive. Every customer counts, after all. Unfiltered, honest, but not tactful. At large scales, not only the social, but the individual and whole society are destroyed in chaos. The ending, in typically obscure fashion, shows this. The Lord of Frenzy ending is the only one without any context. There is no dialogue, no description of the age, no story of how it will be remembered. Everything has been destroyed. Finally, chaos is linked to time. Predictability, chaos, order. Without time, do these make sense? Order is, in some sense, predictable or patterned over time. And I think that's a really interesting comment to make. Not that I necessarily agree with it, because we do have Melina who shows up and tells us that she'll give us destined death. But to be fair, there is no narrator that goes along with it. So I see where he's going from with that angle or coming from with that angle. But for what it's worth, we do have Melina threaten the tarnished that they will kill us as surely as night follows day. So there is kind of a weird implication of time's relation to the Lord of Chaos ending. Not that I necessarily think that's literal. It's probably more metaphorical. And he might be right here in that like time kind of ceases. I don't really know. There might be another age that does follow the Lord of Frenzied Flame ending if Melina pulls through. But it's just kind of all left in the air. Like pretty much every ending, unfortunately. Do I know if Blythe is called a good egg in Japanese or is that an English thing? It's just a funny thing to say. I could double check it right here. Alright, I'll probably check it like as we continue to watch. Chaos has no predictability at any time. Yet, chaos cannot die. Therefore, chaos is immortal. It lives forever, yet has no duration to its existence moment to moment. Yeah, he, uh, Kale just says that he's not like Awari Jiatsu. Jeez, what my pronunciation. He's not a bad guy, essentially. There's, there's nothing about like eggs or anything like that. Let me back up real quick, because that was real quick. How? Yet has no duration to its existence. Time. Yet chaos cannot die. Therefore, chaos is immortal. It lives forever. Yet has no duration to its existence moment to moment. How peculiar. How peculiar, too, that on becoming mad, or within a great frenzied spell, or the great frenzied sun, and ourselves, as the Lord of Chaos, have a core of black. Black is a remarkable colour in Elden Ring. So, Sterquilinus asked, If I associate gold with memory, what do you think about yellow representing resentment and or the excess of memory? I don't know about resentment because we do have a lot of represent 
resentment. No, a lot of re resentment lingering in things like um, ghost flames specifically. If, if you, depending on how you want to take like the concept of a, an Onyo or like a, a vengeful ghost, um, there's also resentment with the wraiths. Although you could say that those are like yellow or golden, I, I, you know, arguable. Um, so is there resentment in the chaos flame? I don't necessarily know about that. It feels more like grief in some ways where they just want to get rid of their pain. But sure, like resentment could possibly tie into it. Like I think like the chaos angle is very nuanced because it's anti-natalism. And there's like a lot of reasons to be against life in terms of like being depressed, sad, angry, um, full of resentment, remorse, grief, all those kinds of very complicated negative emotions. But that's a good question. Let me back up five seconds just to uh, get that thought line there. Black is a remarkable color in Elden Ring, and we believe that it is paired with time. Time is referenced heavily in-game. A god is supposed to live a life eternal. The Dragon Lord lives beyond time. We can stop the meddling of an outer god, but only when beyond time. Ancient dragon smithing stones lightly twist time, which allow the creation of a weapon capable of slaying a god. Time is an essential aspect of everything, and it is very linked to gods, life, death, entropy, and much more. Time, after all, dictates the duration of your existence. However, time is not directly part of existence, in the same way red or blue is. In a similar way, it might be said that black is not truly a colour. Instead, there is a scale on which black and white are the extremes, darkness to lightness, and all colours can be shifted along this scale. To clarify this, it is easiest to look at one end of that scale. What is black? Black is one extreme end of time rates. Time stopping. When something stops progressing in time, it turns black. An obvious and simple example is death. The lands between are shrouded by death's dark fate. Fate becoming dark is a fate that stops. One form of death, though there are many forms, is if a being stops continuing in time. Black is death lightning. Death blight. Part of the god slaying black flame. The forbidden shadow plucked from the golden order upon its creation. And the black that ends Radigan's life eternal. It's kind of interesting that he would go with Black Flame when it said that its god-slaying power was lost, so you could make the argument that it lost the power of death and is therefore black. And I would make the argument that death... Well, I guess this isn't necessarily related to time, so yeah, never mind. He's using Soul's logic. No light means no time. Yeah, with the repair spell. The boluses we consume to robust ourselves against death blight are black. Time is so essential to death that, to those beyond time, death may not apply. Black may help boost the effectiveness of killing in and of itself. The Knight Riders are dressed all in black, and their weapons are jet black. They were deliverers of death for great warriors, knights, and champions. The black could be more than symbolic, given their aim. Of note here are the Evergales and Ordener the I, I think I might be missing something here. Maybe I got like distracted in my own thoughts. I'm, I want to back up real quick it, it, with relation to the idea of death in time, just to make sure I'm on the same page. Because in some ways, I think the two are a little bit incompatible. Extreme end of time rates. Time stopping. When something stops progressing in time, it turns black. An obvious and simple example is death. Okay, yeah, I do kind of disagree with this. And going back to what he was mentioning with like the, uh, 
time aspect being related to the scales of like Placidus Axe and the ancient dragon smithing stones. It's that I feel like the reason things don't die is because they're stopped in time. And so if time continues, death can continue. Although maybe he, he said that and I'm just kind of like being distracted and, and not picking up on it right now. The lands between are shrouded by death's dark fate. Fate becoming dark is a fate that stops. One form of death, though there are many forms. So yeah, fate stopping because time has stopped. I, I don't necessarily agree with that. It, with it being death, I feel like fate being stopped kind of preserves life in the context of Elden Ring. And that's kind of what happens when destined death is removed. Like with destined death removed, fate is stopped, but life continues, which is a little bit unintuitive, unintuitive perhaps. Is if a being stops continuing in time. Black is death lightning. Death blight. Part of the god slaying black flame. The forbidden shadow plucked from the golden order upon its creation. And the black that ends Radigan's life eternal. The boluses we consume to robust ourselves against death blight are black. Yeah, and again with like the Radigan stuff, that's a little bit contentious to me because. Sorry for the dog in the background. Um, this red mist, or wow, red mist, this black mist is part of him and it is his left hand when he's like fighting against us in you know the first fight with radigan and it does become the elden beast so it isn't necessarily death i feel obviously like there are a lot of ties to like black and death so maybe it's more like the time aspect that i'm disagreeing with but the boluses we consume to robust ourselves against death blight are black Time is so essential to death that, to those beyond time, death may not apply. Black may help boost the effectiveness of killing in and of itself. The Knight Riders are dressed all in black, and their weapons are jet black. They were deliverers of death for great warriors, knights, and champions. The black could be more than symbolic, given their aim. Of note here are the Evergales and Ordener the Liturgical Town. For both of these we can enter another realm and we find the world beyond shrouded in darkness. Yet this does not seem to be a new place, at least not entirely. After all, the runes we drop on death are findable in our reality. So are Everjails in fact the ultimate prison? A jail that holds its prisoners by freezing time? They are called Everjails after all. There are more complicated aspects of time just to kind of answer that rhetorical question, I would feel compelled to say no because somehow Blythe does escape. But for what it is worth, Blythe is a shadow, so he might have a more uh, inherent connection to darkness that would allow him to escape the Everjails, perhaps? But, right, moving on. I'm stopping, for which Miyazaki seems to have been partly inspired by scientific theories about the universe. Time, or any meaning of time, stops at the centre of chaos. What do we see at the centre of the Flame of Frenzy when it is intense enough? A black core. As we have mentioned, I, I wanna, chaos is eternal, but has no- I feel so bad for like stopping and rewinding so often, but I'm not sure that follows. Time, or any meaning of time, stops at the centre of chaos. Does anybody know where he's getting this idea from? Is, is this just like a hawkshotism, or is, is there like something more to this? Because this isn't necessarily something that I know about. You don't think I'm fond of mechanical concessions like Souls Pickup being included in lore crafting? I mean, if somebody has a cool idea, I'm willing to listen to it. But that is that does tend to be something where I'm a bit more critical of it for sure. Recall, you recall the ancient wisdom of Metallica, darkness imprisoning me. <laughs> it's taken your arms, taken your legs, your sight, your hearing. All right. Um. Okay, graceful Aurora, you think or thank you so much. You have a good night. 
So El Degusta says, you think he means in sheer chaos, there is no causality, so time means nothing. Okay, I can kind of see where you're, where he could be coming from with that angle, I guess. But would that mean time is stopped or that like time is just converged? I, I don't know. Anyway, thanks for trying to uh, put that in perspective for me. What do we see at the center of the Flame of Frenzy when it is intense enough? A black core. As we have mentioned, chaos is eternal but has no duration, therefore paradoxically, its time state does not progress. Another place where time slows and eventually stops is areas of deep gravity, and black is exactly what we see in the center of powerful gravity spells. The other end of the scale is white. All colors can lighten by adding white, but what is full white? Where black is the current of time completely stopping, white is deep time duration. A maximum time duration is infinite. So too deep a color and it ceases to move in time. Too diluted and pale, it lasts and lasts. But what is the only thing that truly lasts forever? Nothingness the permanent background in which all things come and go. So depth of color is more intense in its existence but has less duration, and as things become whiter they last longer but are less intense. This scale is actually therefore simply an aspect of all colors. The world of Elden Ring confirms this. Whiteness increases time duration, but at a cost. All items we make with white meat say this clearly lasts longer than traditional cured meat, but with reduced effectiveness. Albanorix show this too. However, color is not surface deep, so we have to be careful as we move to more complicated things in the world, such as creatures. Every Albanorix show it too. Albanorix show this too. That they last longer? I'm not... ...traditional cured meat, but with reduced effectiveness. Albanorix show this too. Or is it the reduced effectiveness? I'm a little bit curious because the, their legs are like turning black and fading away and then they do die with age. So is he saying they're white? I mean, I would make the argument they're silver, but that might be because like, I know they're technically like silver people. But of course, he might be coming to the conclusion of white because of like albino, which is a little bit unfortunate because of the localization, I suppose. But yeah, OK, going back. Yeah, I'm totally not on board with like the white being timeless and eternal. Although he might give more support for that. However, color is not surface deep, so we have to be careful as we move to more complicated things in the world, such as creatures. Everything inside and out has a color and an influence. Something may be as much skin as clothing, and we only discover the color of blood in battle. Luckily, Albanorix do not only have white skin, but also white blood. What is their nature? As we expect for something. Right, and this would just be a fundamental disagreement on his part and my part, where I would argue that it's silver, so I'll just kind of like take this stuff at face value, I guess, and try not to pause so often. I feel bad. Things so pale to the core, they are extremely weak. Their bows are specifically designed to require dexterity over strength to master. They need wolves to help them move in battle. When we summon Latena, she has exceptionally low health for a summon. Only young Albanorix manage carrying the shield of their namesake. Yet, for all this weakness, whiteness makes them last and last. As deep time goes by, Albanorix wash out their color and become nothing. My legs will soon fade, and with them my life. Fade. So, what is health in terms of time duration? Not grey, which is time itself, disordered and messy. Health cannot function without good timekeeping. Not black, which is stalling the stream, clogging it unhealthily like a sludge. Nor too pale, which is like butter spread over too much bread. Health is surely somewhere in between. This is what those in the know wish for, healthy color. And to some, it was gifted long ago. The grace of gold blessed those who were first to serve it with the most vivid coloration. To be healthy, whatever your mix is of color, is to be vivid. Just as all the ranges of the scale have an impact, 
The two extremes, black and white, have an important relation. What has ceased to exist, and what lasts and lasts? Is the eye, the window to the soul and mind, representative of the departure of intelligence in later generation albinorics, but the whiteness of their longevity is still shown in the body? The two extremes of the scale are very useful individually, but they are also useful together. You can kill with white too, just as with black and the mix of stopping something with black, and then making that moment last forever, with white, is deadly. Or, making an aspect of something sustain indefinitely, which will eventually kill, works too. Stopping Scarlet Rot is simply halting its progression in time, but if time is recontinued, it means death. Dark emotions are intense and consuming, but they move on fast, like a child's. Paler emotions are calmer, but last longer. In raw nature, white emotions might be long-term gratitude or regret, while black is more likely to be brief but consuming anger or elation. But any emotion can be light or dark, it is defined by intensity and duration. What we can be sure about is that emotions which are inextricably linked with eternity will be black or white. Despair, according to Eternal Darkness, has a core of black. Despair is the complete loss or absence of hope. You know what you hope for can never come to pass, and never is black in its time state. I think it would be also important to consider things like the Inquisitor's Girandole, which burns the victim's blood and induces despair. So maybe you could make the argument that it chars the blood black or something like that. But in my mind, it tends to be because of the removal of gold within the blood and therefore like the will, but I don't really think that's like too important within this, within this context. I am a little bit disappointed that I feel like, oh, he already went past black and into white. Okay, I thought there was going to be more to it. So um, he does mention a couple of emotions that he would correlate to white, but I don't remember if he actually listed a specific emotion with black. Which isn't the biggest of deals, it's just kind of like the consistency, I guess, between a couple of them. I feel like a lot of this stuff is just like interesting observations that are like made to fit certain ideas and you can just kind of like make it work with almost anything if you try hard enough. Kind of like a Rorschach, perhaps, but I don't know. Um, of course, like a lot of this stuff, I think, extends beyond from software, and so it isn't as novel as, or so it isn't as particular to FromSoft as uh, I, I think I would like, and I'm not so sure if there's anything that like FromSoft is doing that is like substantially different from other games to like make this stuff a bit more relevant with maybe the exception of a couple things that I'm just like kind of failing to think of the of the specifics right now. But I did want to mention uh, one of Chadwick's comments in the chat, which I thought was pretty good. It's that in game gravity stops the stars. Gravity literally stops time and the sequence of events. Time is stopped as Radon uses gravity to hold things at bay. Once gravity is restored, time proceeds forward. So I don't know how literally true that is because like there is of course like not everything is literally paused when Radon halts the constellation. And so time does exist and continues to move forward to some degree. But nonetheless, I still like that idea behind gravity stopping the time of the stars and at the very least like the fate of the Karians and fate in general being related to like death and stuff, I think is pretty poignant. color coding magic classes basically so like i said before i really think that the observation about red and being related to faith in relation to the sorceries is pretty interesting and i'll need to think about that one a bit more because that was something i was initially against but was you know pleasantly surprised by but some of this other stuff i feel like is just a little bit too reaching for me less color theory and more lore metaphysics maybe maybe All right, Boxer Wing, you have a good night, and thanks for joining us. Is there an emotion that is the opposite? 
that matches something existing eternally? Perhaps if hope springs eternal, it is itself white. Purple. Purple has always been a remarkable colour in our world. Extremely hard to find in nature, it was a rare sight before the modern day. Thanks to this unique obscurity, it has been consistently associated with similar ideas across cultures, from east to west. Wealth is a frequent one, anything hard to obtain will have this connotation. More interestingly, there are the associations of spirituality, the subconscious, and imagination. In general, of the border between worlds. This is one case where evidence in-game seems to match with our real-world notions, something not always the case. The colour of sleep in-game is purple. We know this from numerous items of Saint Trina, to perhaps even the first meeting with Rani. What happens when we sleep in our world? It feels like we leave our bodies, or at the very least, the time vanishes. It is certainly a place where the subconscious continues to live, and while opinions vary, no one can deny that there is something magical about dreams. In Elden Ring, dreams achieve great things, sustain generations of warriors in their jars, may even be that which motivates a tarnished. Yet in Elden Ring, the sense of dreams being truly another world is very real. I dreamt for so long. Sleep is the gateway to dreams, and the realm of dreams is a real place. Some may seem to be sleeping, but be quite busy in this dream world. We ourselves enter Fia's dream as she sleeps. We fight Fortisax in her deathbed dream. The surface of the boss fight, a quagmire of purple. Perhaps she uses a sleep pot to put herself to sleep. And yet the events of this shared dream have enormous real world consequences. I think like the sleep pot comment is questionable. She is like a deathbed companion. So there is kind of a lot of, uh, you know, sleep adjacent imagery that goes along with Fia. Not, not that I like disagree that like she has anything to do with dreams. It was just like the sleep pot comment was just like a little bit, uh, a little bit random to me. Um, but yeah, setting that aside, welcome back into the stream, Stella and Goddess Spaghetti. Nice to see both of you again. Trina's torch burns with a purple flame, and these purple flames cause sleep. But Trina is involved in more than just sleep. Trina is clearly depicted with a third eye in the centre of the forehead. The third eye is to see beyond, to see across boundaries, into other worlds. Sleep is simply one of these many borders between worlds. Trina may be a saint of journeying into the subconscious, the dream world, the spiritual world. The energy to bridge these gaps is purple. What is the energy that brings more classical, physical worlds together? The force that defines the border of a world, star, or galaxy? Gravity. That which makes physical bodies move almost with a mind of their own. Indeed, when one thinks that interfering with it causes small lightning sparks, it may be that the matter rebels at our meddling. Gravity is much stronger and much more relevant to physical bodies, and so gravity is a deep purple. In Elden Ring, how do we bring meteorites into a battle? With gravity, preferably with glintstones that boost gravity sorceries, which are, of course, purple. Gravity in Elden Ring pulls, but not merely from distances, but pierces to completely different regions. We don't have to wait for the meteorites to come from space. Gravity can open a door or bridge between worlds as sleep does, bringing collapsing stars or meteorites from nothing, and even pulling objects from the mysterious void. Astol, the leveller of the Eternal City, is very talented at moving through gravity doorways. But the master of moving between worlds is the Elden Beast. What colour does the Elden Beast emit when transporting us to another realm? Deep Gravity Purple. Both gravity and sleep are dragging, sinking forces. One weighs down focus and presence, the other weighs you down physically and exhausts you. 
This shared sinking effect, in different intensities and across different planes, are represented by their shades of purple. It once again fits the pattern of darkness and lightness of colour. Dark purple is more intense, has a stronger physical effect, but it doesn't last as long. At its most intense, it goes black, and as in our world, time stops. Indeed, with stars seeming to dictate fate, this hints at how time, fate, and gravity are connected. Meanwhile, light purple lasts much longer, is gentler, doesn't peer so deeply as the physical, but nonetheless drags us to the world of dreams. What is the most important border to being human? Whether you're a dreamer or purely practical, it is surely the border between the mind and the body. Red is the body, blue is the mind. Red and blue gives purple. Both weaken each other in a way, the body exhausting the mind, the mind questioning and tempering the body. But it is this costly relationship that gives rise to great things. Imagination, dreams, the subconscious, the deep invisible wisdom of the third eye. Purple is this border, neither enough presence to be fully blue, yet not all raw instincts and animal unconsciousness to be red. This mysterious middle is what makes us human, exist too imbalanced in any direction, and the humanity fades away. We have mentioned there are many ways to die in Elden Ring, but total destruction is quite rare. Instead, destroying an essential border that makes us human is one solution. Before the Erd Tree, there was a different system for dealing with the dead. They were burnt in ghost flame. Interestingly, we know from the spirits that resulted from this process that it was not a destruction of everything. The bodies may have been destroyed, raked as ashes, but the spirits lived on, sometimes with great bitterness but they were no longer human. How did they separate these minds, or souls, from their bodies? With Ghost Flame. Ghost Flame burnt this border between the two worlds. What colour is Ghost Flame? Despite the appearance of the magic in the current day, its colour is violet. A purple flower that blooms in graveyards. The hue of Ghost Flame. Alright, yeah, so I just put that into my notes, I may as well take it off now. Um, I was going to bring up Grave Violets in relation to this, but I'm kind of glad that he did. And I do think it is a bit unfortunate. And that's because the localization says that the Grave Violet is the hue of Ghost Flame, as it says it right here, obviously. Unfortunately, the Japanese just says that it's the flower of Ghost Flame. I would have really preferred that the English localization here be correct and that Ghost Flame was once Violet, because that I think that's just a lot cooler of an idea to me personally, but there is a little bit more distance there as well. Uh, before I forget, Platypus, welcome back to the stream. It's nice to see you again. And St. Trina, welcome back. This video is fun. Random stuff you disagreed with, but good stuff overall. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel right now. And I was going to mention some things in relation to purple being both representative of the physical via gravity magic and the spiritual in relation to obviously like gray violets here and like spirits and the dreams with St. Trina. So I don't know if this stuff is supposed to be like directly connected to each other or if it's just more incidental in that they both kind of end up occupying the same space, if that makes sense. And obviously uh, Hawkshaw does have a point here that like the lighter shades of purple are more closely associated with the sleep than like the deeper shades of uh, purple for like gravity magic and stuff, which is perfectly fine. So yeah, I just don't know if it's uh, a coincidence, if anything. And we see this purple used by a master, the Tibia Mariner, as he brings back dead from their world. He himself fades in and out of this world, likely to the world of the dead, wrapped in purple the whole time. It is unclear why the current Ghost Flame magic and its users are a different hue, however. Is this the remaining colour once all that is purple has burnt away, the body left as ashes? Or maybe only in this later order has Ghost Flame lost its hue? The purple consumables, staffs, grease, plants, all patterned to sleep, gravity, and borders to other worlds. Purple cured meat, called clarifying, prevents the build-up of sleep and madness. 
Sleep of course prevents focus, but madness is interesting, because purple is not the opposite of chaos. Perhaps if the third eye becomes too dominant, we begin to see things in the random chance of the world that simply aren't there. It is a fine line between intuition and madness. The subconscious and its interpretation, dreams and understanding, the outside world and its patterns, it is so easy to fall into superstition and fantasy. Imagination can run wild. You might end up believing in what simply doesn't exist. And yet, the mysteries of purple are so seductive. Green is a more abstract colour than red or blue, but it is essential to both in the lands between. In our playthrough, green might be seen as less important, as it is less relatable than red, but it is just as fundamental. We meet green time and time again in game, when it helps us as stamina and hinders us as poison. But it is more complicated than that. For stamina, there are many items which show the pattern. Green spill crystal tear raises max stamina, its green burst cousin raises stamina recovery, and green turtle talisman does the same. A turtle neck pickled in green also boosts stamina recovery, a completely different effect to the red, unpickled neck from the same creature. But what is stamina? Stamina is defined as the ability to sustain prolonged physical or mental effort. But what gives that ability in essence? What is physical and mental activity, really? It seems to be reducible to motion in the physical world, and in the mental, the more abstract, animation. Green is therefore the animating energy for the body or mind. It is in that which moves, animates, progresses, cycles, rises, grows. It is in nature, certainly, but so too in the racing mind. And the body is full of energy. Green in isolation has another clear effect in game. A green medicinal solution creates various cured meats that boost immunity. Immunity helps fight poison. We consume it like a small dose of poison to strengthen our resistances for the future. Neutralizing boluses made from nothing but cave moss, but this time naturally green, also boosts your immunity against poisons. Poison bone darts and arrows poison your enemy, and their tips drip in green liquid. It's funny that uh, Goddess Baguette says the video is following a theme, but this part feels like a stretch. That's funny because I feel like this stuff is probably the most straightforward or amongst the most straightforward. I don't really have too many issues with it. I like the idea of green being related to locomotion specifically. I think that's kind of an interesting thought. I, I want to think about that a bit more on my own for sure. But what, what else was I going to say with it? Oh yeah, green is also just kind of like representative of nature and growth, which, you know, might be, you could potentially make the argument that has to do with like motion to a degree, but I think there might also be some more green stuff to consider with like some of the conspectuses, which as I mentioned like way earlier in the stream, I don't remember the differences between like the different Glenstone schools as well as I perhaps should. So maybe there is something more there. And it is ironic that Azure is the green sorcerer instead of blue. And also, welcome back to the stream. Who was it that just came in? Two hit good. Nice to see you again. Yeah, that's who it was. And was there somebody else that I missed? For anybody else whom I may have missed, welcome back to the stream. Or welcome in if it's your first time. Green means gotta go fast? I thought that was uh, blue. <laughs> various horn charms have various effects, patterned by their colour. The one that boosts immunity has green on the horns. And of course, everything that causes typical poison follows the same pattern. The pattern goes on well beyond this, but is this the other side of the same coin? Could animation itself be poison? And if so, how? The first hint to green's nature is the fact that the green rule for poison, not rot, which we will come to,
continues across plants to inanimate stones to medicine. The second is that there is a consistent colour difference, a consistent shade of green that differentiates stamina, or healthy animation, with unhealthy animation, poison. Poisons in our world are not a specific shade of green. Stamina green is consistently a rich, vivid green, sitting healthily in the range of the colour. But poison is a shade of green that moves towards yellow. Why is unhealthy animation towards the shade of yellow? Because it becomes disordered, or by another name, chaotic. Better to have ordered motion, even if it is a little slower than desired, over chaotic motion. Animation going wrong in the body is very linked to timing going wrong, movement being paired with time. We know from black and white that grey timekeeping doesn't do well for health. What about chaotic movement or animation within our bodies? What can happen if the body's processes go out of sync? How fast might we last with a sped up heart and a slowed down liver? or a metabolism many times too fast. Chaotic bodily processes are deadly, even slight rhythm errors between them over long periods of time causes huge problems in the organs. Therefore, if the green is not the right shade and it gets in your system, it is poison. Green has simpler emotions than red or blue, and while it has its highs and lows, its place is the animation of things, of emotions and thoughts too the rate of change, whether they cycle or not, how fast they come and go. Green also has its own mysteries. Is the light green Celadon blade of the Godskin Apostles, simply for increasing the thrust speed? It works. The thrusts from specifically the weapon, regardless of wielder, are swifter than the eye can follow. But is there some other secret? Is Selen's glintstone a sickly poison green, evidence of her twisted mind? She was the Graven Witch, after all. And how to- So green might also be associated with like the arcane to a certain degree because Selen's glintstone crown boosts the arcane. But to give some other thoughts about the green in general, which I'm a little surprised he hasn't like brought up. Um, and especially in the East, the idea of green is associated with youth and springtime. So ironically enough, like uh, the characters for, hold on, let's, let's just pull it on up. So this is going to be a little bit awkward to talk about in relation to a, th a video about like color theory specifically, but the characters here for uh, like youth Seishun. So the, the first one is technically like blue, but this blue here represents green as well and then the next character is spring so it's like literally like green spring means youth um and so that's a something that's just like very popular in like japanese uh media like if any of you like watched naruto like a uh, guy sensei and Brock Lee or Rock Lee, whatever his name is <laughs> broccoli knows Rockley. um they both wear green and they always talk about like youth and stuff like that uh, Seishun is just like a very big, like cultural phenomenon there in Japan. And I'm pretty sure like the, it extends to like China and Korea as well. So there is this weird overlap between blue and green is what I'm getting at. But it, I think it just represents like youth, youthful vitality, growth, and at least for what it's worth in the upper class robe, it's described as being traditionally the child's first show of burgeoning independence so i think that just kind of goes back into the idea of growth and maybe i'm a little bit surprised that hawkshaw didn't try to say that green is the color of independence as a result green is also a big component of stagnation and rot with scarlet rot still having some green in it yeah the element of wood and the well spring of life why isn't there any alcohol in Elden Ring? Is it amber gold color? Well, they they did initially want to have like an uh, alcohol analog with the Dream Brew, but they cut it for whatever reason that they did. You always thought Scarlet Rot was yellow and red because it was the slow death of the body and as such is slow and during pain that affects memory. I don't know if he's going to go into like Scarlet specific. Okay, 
exactly what he's going to do. All right, I'll, I'll wait to talk about Scarlet Rot until uh, he goes into it now. To explain this remarkable green sky on that fateful night of the Black Knives, perhaps you have spotted a similar sky in your playthrough too. There is one poisoning game that is not green that is called Rot. What is Scarlet Rot? Once again, it is named by colour, and from its name we have the answer. If there is more and more energy, green, in life and bodies, red, what happens? What did we say was the colour more energetic life moved to, as it became more madly mobile, more chaotic? Red trends to yellow, which is exactly what you get when you mix red and green, and one of the closest shades of red to the border of yellow, or chaos, is scarlet. Scarlet is life, but too manically energetic. It grows and lives too vigorously and chaotically, consuming and destroying its host. Life out of control. So just like a little bit of a translation note, which is a bit unfortunate. The Scarlet Rot in Japanese is just more or less called the Red Rot. And Crimson, at least, is more associated with life. I, Yeah, so I'll just leave that alone for now. Um, is he going to talk about it a little bit more? Maybe not. So generally the way that I view Scarlet Rot is that it's essentially life gone amok and that there's too much going on. And it's essentially like the equivalent of a cancer because death has been removed as a component of life. And in the descriptions of things like mm, poison mist and poison armament, they say... Um, wait, that isn't Poison Mist. <laughs> they say, those who dwell within poison know rot all too well. The death that begets life, that comes to all equally. That is to say, it is the cycle of rebirth put into practice. So going back to what he was saying earlier in the video about red being related to like life and vitality, I think that's very true and very um, symbolic of the Scarlet, aka Red Rot. And for what it's worth, in like 1.0, I think Millennia was still referred to as the, the Queen in Red or something like that. The Red Queen. Um, or maybe that was just something else. Maybe it was like the Chinese 1.0 text. I don't remember. A shade of red. Yay, English having five bazillion color words. And yeah, that, that's something that I'm not like super... Uh, confident in myself like the actual differences between like scarlet crimson cinnabar etc you don't know about the red to yellow pipeline yeah i mean let's just let him cook <laughs> scarlet empress no she was called like the red queen at least in, in something red seems to also symbolize consumption whereas green is generation yeah i think that's a really good way to say that chadwick you lose me at Burgundy? I'm Ron Burgundy? Scarlet brings us to the idea of colours being similar, being neighbours. Of course, there is no one nature for any colour. It is all hues. What is the order and relationship of colour? In a natural splitting of colours from white light, we can see it clearly. Red is on one side of the split, leading to yellow, to green, to blue, and then to purple. The shades of these colours are infinitely varied as it goes between them. Every colour can be made by the two that border it on either side. So a wheel can be formed, as a famous alchemist did long ago. More than the darkness or lightness, where is the colour exactly? How close is it to others? The hue, as we have mentioned, may divide gravity nature from sleep, but there is no strict border in any of their natures. Everything can approach and mix. Heresy is not native to the world. It is but a contrivance. All things can be conjoined. So red going too close to yellow gives scarlet. Chaotic life is scarlet rot. Blue gains some green and it becomes energized, full of innovation and impact on the real world. 
but too much green and the mind cannot keep the stability for things like attention or memory. Become too green, a shade of turquoise, and you might be called a bluntstone. Perhaps being this hue his whole life led Thops to a great insight. A mind that is internally over-animated repels the entry of external mental influence. Wait, wait, wait. Did... I just want to double check before I, like, criticize. It's energized. F is scarlet rot. Blue gains some green, and it becomes energized, full of innovation and impact on the real world. But too much green, and the mind cannot keep the stability for things like attention or memory. Become too green, a shade of turquoise, and you might be called a bluntstone. Okay, so maybe Hawkshaw is trying to imply that Topes is blue plus yellow? Because he definitely connected him to yellow earlier, but now he's going with green. I'm not sure why he's making the difference just yet. Become too green, a shade of turquoise, and you might be called a bluntstone. Perhaps being this hue his whole life led Thops to a great insight. A mind that is internally over-animated repels the entry of external mental influence. It raises the question of whether sorcery damage- Yeah, so I think that claim right there of Topes being overly animated kind of contradicts Hawkshaw saying that he represents fatigue and yellow earlier. He connected him to green blue. I was just trying to be like charitable. <laughs> Just trying to like say, hey, you know, yellow is a little bit further on the green spectrum. So I, I was just trying to be kind. Damage really arises simply from hey, strong nervous. mental belief. Moving further away from blue moves further away from sentience and more into the automatic animations of the natural world. Comets represent this, always much more green than the bluer stars, and are never referred to as sentient. Stars on the so I feel like he's he's directly contradicting himself like here blue move Oh moving further away from blue moves away from sentience. Never mind, never mind. Okay, okay. Simply from strong mental belief. Moving further away from blue moves further away from sentience and more into the automatic animations of the natural world. Okay, okay, I'm I'm comets I'm following. represent this. Always much more green than the bluer stars, and are never referred to as sentient. Stars, on the other hand, are referred to repeatedly as active, conscious agents. Green animation moved towards yellow is poison. Mind and body mix into the purple worlds of sleep, dreams, and the mystic, and inanimate bodies moving with what seems to be minds of their own is purple gravity. Most interestingly, and what really shows the purposeful nature of Elden Ring's colour design, is in opposites. Colours may have associations in our world, but their opposite associations do not match to their colour opposites. What do we mean by that? Well, for most colour systems, opposite associations do not have opposite colours, or light wavelengths, and vice versa. Thus, we do not find in our world that the associations of purple are the opposite of the associations of green. The odds of them doing so is remarkably low. If they did, you might start to say that it was a natural law. But what do we find in Elden Ring? White and black are the two opposites of time, but it is a scale for all colours. And grey, the mess and mix of time states, when inverted, is still grey. It has no time opposite, unlike black or white. So what about true hues? The opposite of red, heat, is ice-hued blue. The opposite of chaos, the rational mind, regulating and maintaining control. The opposite of purple, the sinking, dragging sleep and gravity force, is green, the animating, uplifting energy of stamina and cycles. Clearly, this is a conscious design for the law of Elden Ring. I think a lot of that stuff was definitely interesting but i do feel like it might be somewhat contradictory to some of his claims earlier on like he said yellow was fatigue and although it's not completely opposite of purple it it, it kind of is almost so yeah it's, it's just kind of weird that like i don't know 
Um, anyway, I did want to welcome in Yogi to Buffalo again and Jan Narvis when I talked over the video. Welcome both back to the chat. The color spectrum could reflect the metaphysical diversity of Elden Ring's cosmic themes. Like, there are no right answers, just a spectrum of experience and philosophy. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel about it, that obviously there are some larger themes, but I'm not entirely sure, like, how definitive they are and what, like, the broader... How do I say it? Like, uh, well, like... <laughs> It's, it's going to sound bad the way I've got it phrased in my head, but like what the broader point of like looking at this stuff is like, obviously like there is, you know, fun to be had and things to be gained from like looking at the symbolism. But I'm just wondering if he is going to make like a, a bigger point about this other than just like individual observations. Not that he necessarily has to have one, but it kind of feels like he's building that way, but I'm not sure. So anyway. That's because color associations are cultural. And yeah, that's some of the other stuff that's a little bit uh, difficult to parse. Like the things with uh, what he said about the Albin Orcs, I disagree with. But that's partially cultural in me knowing that like Albin Orc comes from a localization of silver person. And Albin Orc meaning white gold. So I am very curious as to what he says about gold, especially in like relation to yellow. And obviously on my notes, there are some things like my notes down there. There are some things that we haven't quite covered yet that um, I do have some questions about with this video. He's trying to mix the concepts of each color to get the res resulting color idea. It works for some of them, but some are a stretch. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now, Scott Lisi. And I do agree that color station color associations are not entirely cultural, but there nonetheless there are some like cultural uh, differences. Like even though I said like Seishun is like you know the whole green springtime of youth, like obviously that's a very cross cultural thing. But like the Albanorc thing is one that just stands to be a di bit different. And like I said earlier, like I'm not super familiar with like color theory in Japanese, and there's a ton that goes into it especially with like the arrangement of flowers and even that thing was kind of like more popular at least in the u.s uh in the past and i'm not familiar with that stuff like the art of flower arrangement and like you're not supposed to wear certain colors like white after labor day i think because it like represents something like uh it's just a little bit beyond me but uh, nonetheless i am still having fun like looking at this video and learning about other people's perspectives in the process design for the law of Elden Ring. Let's move on to some more nuanced colours. There are some unique colours, some more common, some rare, but all mysterious. Silver, whether in the real world or Elden Ring, always takes second place to gold. Often the name for money in various cultures, it is much more practical than the hard-to-come-by gold. Silver is the most reflective metal, and the best conductor of electricity and heat. It really can seem to become one with things, visually and energetically. In Elden Ring, the nature of silver is similar, but much more magical. Silver seems in nature quite similar to Quicksilver, or its other name, Mercury. While this metal is not referenced in-game, the silver we find seems to flow and run like liquid. Silver tears are liquid, Nox weapons stretch and warp, forms from this same tear. The center of this creature is a larval tear, within which we can see the apparent liquid flow of silver under its surface. In alchemy, silver is associated with the moon, and snakes. Silver doesn't appear in any of the all-colour or multicolour items. It doesn't seem to be part of the mainstream world and arrangement of colours. Mercury, being a liquid metal, is perceived in alchemy as being able to cross natures and borders. It also competes with silver for its reflectivity, and has been used in telescopes for this property. Most interestingly, almost all elements can combine with mercury in a process called amalgamation. 
both Silver and Quicksilver seem to have the ability to take on the properties of other things, whether visually or physically absorbing, or in its heat or electric nature. In Elden Ring, Silver truly takes on the nature of others. We can even birth ourselves anew with this Silver, and it is hinted that maybe a Lord can be made by a Silver imitation. While this nature of Silver seems to be a pattern, it is still a mystery. Why is the metal of Trina's sword, full of purple magic, silver? To conduct the realm of dreams? Is Oracle Envoy Blood silver? They look somewhat similar, white and blue, to the white-blooded Albanorix, and Albanorix were formed from a sacred drop of dew. Was that dew as silver as the shield that represents it? And what is blue silver? a mysterious metal born from the same mother as Albanorix themselves. So yeah, that just goes back into what I was saying earlier with Albanorix being more closely related to silver. As far as like the blue silver, it it is kind of like literally what it says, <laughs> even in Japanese. Um, I, I, ha I do remember like looking that up <laughs> a while back, but what, what is it exactly? So yeah, they use a kind of... Um, interesting combinations of characters for that so like the first character for like this silver is um a less common version of blue and then it just like follows silver so this first character is aoi which is blue and then gin is silver and so this is like the most basic form of blue but i think this one represents like a light blue uh not like sky blue but like a azure as it says like a silvery kind of blue i guess so, yeah. What was the point of me saying that? I don't really know. Just uh, cultural relevance, I guess. And yes, the mixture of silver and gold is Electrum. Amber is perplexing. Okay, so he's done with silver. So one of the things that goes along with silver in my mind is the idea of it being inorganic uh, in terms of like Elden Ring specifically. Obviously silver is inorganic in real life too, but um, the Albanorics are like artificial forms of life and they can't reproduce on their own. And I think part of that is because they're inorganic and there is this weird dichotomy between silver and gold where they can seemingly dilute each other. And this is something we talked about in the Discord uh, quite a bit, like last week or two weeks ago, something like that, where um, I was being more or less grilled about like the relationship between gold and silver. But if you look at the Night Maiden Silver Mist, it can directly reduce HP. When you summon in the Silver Tier uh, Spirit Ashes, you need HP to summon it. I think it's tied into like the Bloodless stuff, not necessarily like Silver directly, but anyway. Um, and vice versa, I think the more Silver gets introduced to something that is like a gold-based life form, the more it dilutes it. And my example of that would be Renala's failed Juvenile Scholar rebirths. The more times you rebirth the player, they're supposed to lose a little bit more of it because um, with sleep becomes oblivion and you kind of like lose memories and memories are related to gold. But setting that aside, when Bach gets a silver tier to be reborn as a human, he kind of loses himself in the sauce there. And you might even be able to make the argument that the pseudo silver mimic or silver tier like rebirthed commoners from like the rune bears the random lion thing in Altus Plateau, like up there, and the the other rune baron, like the consecrated snowfield and the troll in Kaled, they might have lost part part of themselves as well. Perhaps we don't really know because like most things have kind of lost their intelligence as the lands between goes on. But anyway, yeah, I do think silver and gold dilute each other is kind of what I'm saying over and over and over again here. Liquid silver is inherently formless and near an external order and needs an external order to give it shape or meaning. Yeah. So I don't know about that. I almost feel like silver and Elden Ring can kind of represent form. And that must be why like the silver tiers 
are necessary to be rebirthed from Manala, and we could just kind of give gold into that silver-based form to remake the tarnished body. But I'm not entirely sure, like, how well that actually fits the game. Amber in our world is fossilized tree resin. Different color ambers form from the Erd tree's old sap. As in our world, sap and thyme are the ingredients. The various hues of amber match the various natures of color. However, most important is the traditional color of amber. It is very connected to the process of rebirth. The amber egg of Renala is a beautiful example. Why is rebirth this color? And more confusingly, why does it need silver to operate? The sacred dewdrop tear represented in the silver mirror shield has amber atop it, another strange relation. Amber Starlight says that amber-hued stars must command the gods. The draft made to attempt to control Rani is an amber draft. This color seems to have something to do with formation. Formation of life, formation of a future, and fate. But it is a color of mystery we need to explore. What is Gloam? Gloam is twilight, or the darker part of twilight. Gloom. Shade. Given what we know about the colors and relation to death, Gloam would be a fitting color for the Queen's eyes. Who it might be remains in the dark. Copper is another color that is all. Obviously, I think we're all going to be a little bit surprised that he didn't like bring up Melina in relation to that. Although, I'm, yeah, it's, it's all good. Also a metal. Copper appears vividly in certain swords. Regalia of AOK says that the copper coloration of the blade is a conduit for its wielder to move it by their will alone. And again, the Japanese for copper here could literally mean red gold, because they do use a more archaic phrasing in the Japanese rather than like do which is uh, typically used for like copper today. So I think the red gold is more in line with the idea of like the Crucible Knights and that kind of thing as well. <laughs> I'm once again asking for your support to slay God. What are we doing playing Final Fantasy? We believe copper is therefore the color of the will. The region that uses this sword also gave us Elema of the Briar. His shield from a foreign land is the land of AOK. So yeah, that's just going to be a hard disagree from me, but that's also because I have like a little bit of extra context to recontextualize what this reference to copper is. So I totally understand where he's coming from with here, and I think that's just a little bit unfortunate, I suppose. A land of proudly solitary ascetics. Ascetic is defined as characterized by severe self-discipline and abstention from all forms of indulgence. This sword is from a region where willpower is immensely important and practiced daily. The will is the color of copper. Bronze seems to support this. Bronze is an alloy mostly of copper and a little tin. The gargoyles seem to be operated from afar. Their swords are made of bronze, as are the hoops on their ankles and wrists, almost like a puppet. Tin men moved by the will at distance. Additionally, how does one make copper color? You mix a lot of yellow, chaos, a lot of red, animal life and raw instincts, with a little blue. What could better represent willpower than copper? Gold. When a little bit of my- no, but to, to answer that a bit more seriously, I think the gold connection becomes a little bit more apparent if you can connect that idea of willpower to Mikola's unalloyed gold needle. Mind or spirit has to fight as the underdog against the chaos of the world and the baser desires to do what you truly wish to do. Will is found in this hardship, where one must compete against these two natures and win. There is one remarkable color in game that is not truly a color. Drained of color. According to the natures of color, this type of color should be defined by its emptiness of nature, and this is just what we see. Eclipse Crest Great Shield says, The eclipsed sun, drained of color, 
is the protective star of soulless demigods. It is an emptiness that matters here, the edge is the symbol that matters. Soulless demigods have lost their natures, their bodies lie drained of red vigour. The animation, the mind, the character, the soul has left this plane. They are colourless. Nascent butterfly, an important ingredient in many consumables, has translucent wings. It appears as if it has just emerged from its cocoon for its entire life. It has very little nature. Colourlessness can be filled, it is pure potential. Nascent butterfly makes dappled, multicoloured meat. It doesn't interfere with these hues, it is colourless, and can take on varieties of colours without staining it with its own. This concept comes again with somber smithing stone, somber being defined as dull in colour or tone. The description of the stone again reminds us that colour is an essential building block of the world. Shard of smithing stone drained of colour. What a peculiar thing for a blacksmith to find important. Finally, it says, special armaments with unique characteristics cannot be strengthened with coloured smithing stones. Colour has nature intrinsically and irremovably. If something is a unique and balanced mix of colours, to use a coloured stone would literally change its nature, therefore to maintain its uniqueness of nature, which in Elden Ring means its remarkable uniqueness of colour, you need to use a colourless smithing stone. Yeah, I actually strongly agree with that bit quite a lot, and to go along with that, I do believe that could be a kind of thematic tie into the Tarnished, because the way that Tarnished are referenced in Japanese uses like the character for fading, so that you could understand them as fading ones. Like Tarnished kind of gets that idea across in English as well, although it's typically associated with metals, so it's not quite as obvious, perhaps. And so going back to like the somber smithing stones being drained of color. I think tarnished are drained of color when they become tarnished, obviously. And that idea can be extended perhaps a little bit further to things like the uh, Eclipse Great Shield, as uh, Hawkshaw was saying, and even slightly further with perhaps the tarnished golden sunflowers. So even though they're like withered and wilted and faded, they still retain a holy essence. So they might have... A little bit of color remaining in them but they've also simultaneously been dried which is kind of weird to think about or like faded and i do think that ties back into the somber smithing stones because i think it's somber smithing stones tiers six and seven which say that they're technically gold smithing stones that have been drained of color so the way that i've looked at it for quite a while here is that somber smithing stones are all golden smithing stones that have, that have been uh drained of their gold if that makes sense so kind of a similar thing that we're talking about overall yeah you could say that the tarnished are pale blood they've all been drained to tarnish is to lose luster to lose luster is to reflect less light so yeah there there is a bit more connotations with like metal i think with tarnished but generally the the principal idea is the same So, multicolored. Now we know the basics, we can approach these remarkable dappled patterns. There are of course many base colors. We can therefore make a prediction before looking in game. Multicolored consumables in Elden Ring should have the same effect as its constituent colors. Indeed, multicolored is achieved by the most basic function of something else. These colours, after all, are not mixing. But first, dappled, rainbow, mottled. It goes by many names. The mottled necklace, from an entirely different culture to the Erd Tree, has very clearly three colours on it. Poison green, purple, and red. The exact colours of the more ordinary, immunising, clarifying, and stalwart charms. What is the effect of this vividly coloured accoutrement? precious to the ancestral followers. It raises robustness, immunity, and focus, just like our colours would dictate, and a combination of the more regular coloured horn charms. Our prediction is right. 
This pattern fits across many items. Flask of wondrous physic, a relic of the physic chemists, priests of the Erd Tree. What a curious profession for priests, to focus on the mixing and combinations of base natures. Harnesses the power of crystal tears, which only form after the passage of many moons. Various special effects are bestowed upon the drinker, dependent on the specific mixture of crystal tears. Of course, there are many colours of tears, crimson and green and so on, and with custom combinations, the vision of their effect is multicoloured. One special tear is the opaline hard tear. Opaline is another word for opalescent, defined as showing many small points of shifting colour against a pale or dark ground. Opal is famous for being able to display every colour of the rainbow. If crimson tears and green tears affect HP and stamina, what does this multicoloured tear do? It boosts all forms of damage negation. The dappled cured meat we make, upon closer inspection, has three colours that stain it. Red, purple, and poison green. For what it's worth, apparently opalescent in Japanese is more like pearl grey? Or like pure pearl? Uh, I don't really know. <laughs> so anyway, I, I think it's supposed to be like pearl in colour, so maybe grey. So, whatever. Just bringing that up for anybody who may be curious. And what do these cured meats do when we consume them? Dappled cured meat boosts immunity, robustness, and focus, exactly what the colours red, purple, and off-green do when alone in a cured meat. What is remarkable too is how we make dappled cured meat. The medicinal solution we cure it in doesn't have a combination of the essential ingredients of other meats. The invigorating cured meat, red, has a land octopus ovary in it, but it is not in dappled meat. We don't find a slumbering egg for the sleep resistance, nor a head of a poison resistant dragonfly. There is one item that seems to give all the variety of colour to the dappled meat, a budding horn. This horn began to sprout on a beast that typically bears no horn. Perhaps it's a vestige of the primordial crucible. This horn gives rise to many colours. What is the primordial crucible? Where all life was once blended together. All life, all natures, and therefore, all colours. I actually really, really like that observation. That's something that I haven't like delved too deeply into. I mean, I have to a small degree, but yeah, this, this one's pretty solid, and not one that I was expecting. With the nature of multicoloured established, we can look at where it appears in the lore. We can understand why the rarest and most prized of Miranda flowers are the most varied in colour. There is a great power in the diversity of uses. Astal, formed of many colours together, can cast various forms of magic. And indeed, amongst all this varied colour, appear rings. Why are the celebrants in the windmill village armed with multicoloured rakes, skulls, and sickles? The merchants wear gorgeous multicoloured garments, their famously suave hats studded with many coloured gemstones. Is this the lie of the three fingers? That removing division will bring together this diversity in beauty instead of destruction in chaos? The gods themselves seem to be a multicoloured set. The outer god of Scarlet Rot, the god of Rani's order, the formless mother, and so on. Perhaps white and black is like a many-faced god, acting as many colours, but in fact is one. Colours are so fundamental that the very gods seem to be divided by them, and one god, the greater will, is recognised by one exceptional colour. But nothing is so important in the law of the multicoloured than the crucible and the omens. Hey Zemeth Leo, welcome into this stream. So yeah, I'm curious as to where he's going with this stuff right now. I thought he was immediately about to go into gold. And with the crucible stuff, it is typically associated with life. So the budding horn being associated with multiple colors. It does make sense, but it is also a little bit surprising. 
omens, with the nature of all creatures emerging, have much more than a vestige of the primordial crucible. If yellow is a chaos of everything mixing, multicoloured is something to be nervous of. How things can be multicoloured without mixing to chaos is the place of a most famous colour, and omens are evidence of the breakdown of this colour. As the boundaries of colour begin to weaken and stir up, how close we come to chaos. Morgoth is an omen who knows he is a risk, he is ashamed of his curse. He recanted it and sealed it away in his cursed sword, a beautiful lore item, warped blade of shifting hue. The colours tell us his story. What is an omen but a warped being with many coloured natures shifting and emerging? The accursed blood that Morgoth recanted and sealed away reformed into this blade. When this blood becomes unbound, it emerges. It explodes and mixes in a filthy, off-yellow, staining the thrones. Staining, an important word, explicitly a word for colour. Omens and omen blood, and all that trends towards the primordial crucible, risk blending in a stew of mess, one step from pure chaos. But it is kept at bay, kept at bay by one thing. Gold. So Scalise asks, asks, do trees in Elden Ring change color and drop their leaves? Um, sort of, yes. Maybe not in terms of like changing colors. They certainly did at one time. I don't necessarily think it works the same way now after the shattering and or after Radigan's rise to the Elden Throne and kind of instituting a stasis into the lands between. But for what it's worth... You can see the big Erd tree drop its leaves at night and gain extra experience as a result of it. But setting, you know, what may be a potentially like game mechanic thing aside, we are told that the Erd leaf flowers were fed by leaves that fell from the Erd tree in antiquity. So it seems like the Erd tree doesn't drop its leaves the same way as it used to, perhaps. It's, it's a little bit strange how. It specifies that the leaves fell in antiquity when we can see the earth tree like kind of lose its leaves any night, pretty much. No more New England autumns for the lands between. <laughs> yeah. So I think he said something that I wanted to touch on, but I've forgotten it. Was it about the changing colors of Morgoth's blood, maybe? Or was it the staining of the thrones? So yeah, I think the staining of the thrones, if I'm remembering correctly, is a reference to Kegare and doesn't necessarily mean, like, color staining as much as it means, like, defiling. In our world, gold is formed in stars and is believed to have fallen to the earth in meteorites long ago. It is unreactive and one of the most stable elements. It is very hard to destroy and very hard to make. And of course, it has a unique colour. In alchemy, it is viewed as the highest form of matter, but not only matter, also body, mind and soul. To turn base metals, matter, or our own nature into gold takes many stages, but gold is the final form. This transformation has been undertaken by many great minds in history, but while they gave us many other gifts, gold was never made. In Elden Ring, we need to look at the world and what is in it to see gold's place in the universe. Gold is seen all around us, but it is hard to find on its own, removed from complex systems. Religion, characters, obscure dialogue, none of these help us as gold beginners. Complexity will lead to confusion. We need to find where gold is in the world, simply. And there are three items which are natural, simple, and, importantly, ignored. There won't be any preconceptions about what has been passed by. Golden Rower, Gold-Tinged Excrement, and Beast Blood. First, Golden Rower. 
Red Rower, as we have dealt with, is heavily involved in red nature boosting. Gold Rower is a rarer thing, though it is easily found near the Erd Tree. Gold is easier to find in general near the Erd Tree. More than colour, how does this Gold Rower differ from a typical rower? In what we can make. Red Rower and Rhymed Rower cannot make any dappled meats. Dappled, as we have addressed, are multi-coloured. They have the effects of each colour, yet the meat has identifiable, separate colours in its dappling. Why can the preserving effects of a normal rower not do what is required to make dappled meat, but gold rower can? Gold is required to stop the colours from mixing. It contains the colours in the meat, together, yet separate. Gold-tinged excrement is next. Once again, it has a unique appearance. It has a golden tinge. But we have an enormous clue in this highly ignored substance. Gold-tinged excrement is a highly stable substance. It doesn't dry out, nor does it lose its customary warmth or scent. For better or worse, it remains as it is. Goldness maintains the nature of the thing. Finally, we have fresh beast blood glinting with gold. This glimmering blood never rots or decays. Between these items, the essential nature of gold reveals itself. Gold is order. Gold has the power to hold things in a state or condition that otherwise might change. In a universe where the natures of things are linked with colour, gold is what can hold them in relation. Gold dictates whether they overlap, mix, or are held at a great remove. Without gold, dappled meat would be very dangerous to eat, as its colours would interfere with each other. Without gold, things rot. Without gold, for better or worse, things change unpredictably. Without gold, things rot. I'm not so sure about that one specifically, but I was pretty much on board with a lot of everything else. Yeah, I think this is a very interesting perspective that I would like to examine more fully because I, I do think it makes a lot of sense, especially in regard to remembrances and them being kind of preserved in gold and like runes and stuff. But yeah, I, I think the Scarlet Rot part might be a miss, but I, I probably need to think about that one a bit more too. And also good night, Evil Noah, in case uh, you're still around. Each colour has its opposite in nature, but gold is not a base colour. It is an emergent property and an emergent colour. Just like chaos. And yellow is the shadow of gold. Gold is what can divide and distinguish, and yellow destroys divisions. Interestingly, what is one thing that can break gold down in the real world? Aqua Regia dissolves gold away. Its colour, a vivid yellow. Gold and order is like yellow and chaos. It exists and doesn't exist. It so, not that I like dislike this idea here, although I do think it is at odds with the beginning of his video in talking about how he more or less intended to rely on the spectrum of light to make his color analyses here. And that was part of why I was so curious as to why he was separating yellow and gold and I am curious as to why he separates gold here, maybe because he feels like it has a more metaphysical place within the world of Elden Ring than the color of yellow, perhaps? I'm not sure. Alchemy talk? <laughs> it is an emergent color when all colors are in certain orders. You have faith in gold, you can see it, feel it, but it doesn't exist in the way green does. Break the structure, and gold vanishes into its constituent parts with the true colors within revealing themselves. I feel like that part right there is also a little bit problematic to just kind of blatantly say gold doesn't exist in the way that green does. Just because like you do see it in golden poop, you see it in the blood. And of course, you know, you could argue about the Erd tree and stuff like that, as well as our runes. So maybe he's just trying to say it has like a more metaphysical component again. I don't know. Hey, howdy, welcome into the stream. Is this an ongoing or FR situation? I'm not sure what you mean by FR situation.
If gold is order, gold may have the power of influencing the basic rules of the universe. After all, what are rules, whether in society or the laws of nature, other than order? With enough gold, you can guide these laws as you see fit. You can make things rise or fall. You can make them burn, freeze, reverse in time. You can temper your own being with blue. You can choose how long red lasts, how much green, your amount of purple. The enigmatic Miyazaki told us so before the game's release. The rings you're looking at in the logo are more a representation of the law of the world, the rules, and the order. It's more about how you apply those rules and how you enforce them on the physical world and what effects they have on it. That's what's being represented by the Elden Ring and these overlapping and intersecting rings. It gets a little bit more complicated than that, but I'll leave it there for now. Like dams in rivers, with gold you can direct nature itself. Whether it helps the world in general, or only yourself, depends on your understanding, and your choices. The current imperfection of the golden order, or instability of ideology, can be blamed upon the fickleness of the gods, no better than men. Let us now look at more complicated aspects of gold and see if things fall into place. The shackles for omens have golden symbols on them, and they are bathed in golden magic. They confine omens. Confinement is a form of order. And now we have learnt the multicoloured nature of omens, isn't this just dappled meat and golden roa, but played at a much larger scale? Omens, the same as anything else, are defined by their colours. Omens are too primordial, too verging on the chaotic. If let out to mix, it becomes disordered. Gold, like the golden rower, keeps these shifting hues in place. Morgoth has the nature of what seems to be rats, goats, and many other creatures growing from him. And when the seal he imposed on his own blood seems to break, it is splinters of gold he coughs out first, before the emergence of a muddy, mixed colour. Order is very linked to time. If order is buffeted by non-order, it dissipates over time. This is why Morgoth's shackle, which lacks power, only holds Morgoth for a short time. This is why with time, gold seems to decay to a muddy yellow. Um, I, I do think this is a little bit of a different claim, but setting that aside, I am a little bit curious about how Hawkshaw feels about the healing properties of gold and whether or not he's saying like that's an institution of order. I, I imagine that's what he'd say, and I don't really think that contradicts anything else. I'm just, you know, kind of curious on that perspective. So as for the Erdleaf leaf flower and the tarnished golden sunflower, I don't necessarily know if I would compare this to age specifically, although of course there is a kind of correlation, but I think the difference between these two is because of a difference in the Erd tree with Radigan's ascension to Elden Lord, but that, that's not terribly important right now. Colors naturally mix. And thus, just as Golden Rower is needed for cured meat, so too do we, the player, need runes. Runes are the gold that keep ourselves in order. Without runes, we cannot keep any of the natures of colour. If we consume redness, a boost occurs, but it cannot be maintained permanently, and it fades. The golden runes that can maintain natures in order can allow us to keep different attributes permanently. Think of it like having more gold to add to our own ring. It increases its size. Runes will act as nourishment for the development of any tarnished. If we want more green permanently, we can do that. More runes allows us to alter our own form, our own order. Without order, these natures will mix. We don't necessarily want a strong body to dilute with a strong mind to result in tiredness. Order can raise the parts to a greater whole. It may be that all the basic building blocks of nature are around us all the time, much like in the real world. Everything is only its specific nature as a result of its order. Order does not only apply to the inner, it also applies to the outer world. You can impose order on others, just as you can impose disorder. 
One more complicated aspect of Golden Order, a name which takes a more literal meaning now, is incantations. One spell that imposes order on others is Litany of Proper Death. We you know, thinking about this idea of gold representing order, I do like it in relation to the idea of Albin Orcs and Silver Tears lacking a kind of order in a form, but I do wonder... So, like, even though you could say, like, Silver Tears are formless, like, being formless is sort of still a form in, in a certain way. I know that's like a contradiction in sorts, um, it's very uh, Jeet Kune Do, Bruce Lee, uh, Miyamoto, Musashi, Gorin no Sho, and all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, just a, a liquid still is a form, but it, it's not a fixed form. So anyway, going back to the video and the idea of gold being order, I like it. I'm not like 100% on shirt, like on board with it, but yeah, this is a, a lot better than I think some of the other stuff so far cast it upon those who live in death, and it stops them from arising repeatedly. The description once again is more concerned about image than the physical. It imposes an image of order in bright gold, which damages those who live in death. The spell says the hunters aim to stamp out defiled reason, all for the perfection of the golden order. In their opinion, to live in death is an affront to how order should be. However, the very name, Living in Death, shows how flexible order can be, that such a thing is even possible. The image of order is interesting too. What shape does order always take? Clear, intersecting straight lines, triangles and squares, and of course, most famously, in rings. What is more ordered than a ring, holding an inner and separating an outer, balanced around its centre? Rings are a perfect visual representation of order. They can contain, they can overlap, and bind. Other spell effects and descriptions help us further. Two incantations viewed as very important to the law are the law of regression and the law of causality. Causality, one of the key fundamentals, manifests a small ring of causality within that allows the caster to automatically retaliate upon receiving a certain number of blows. The Fundamentalists describe the Golden Order through the powers of regression and causality. Causality is the pull between meanings, it is the connections that form the relationships of all things. This is one more key. This is because it is fundamental to understand that order is not only static. Something being in a state of order, unchanging through time, is of course ordered, but there is order in processes too that which repeats or has a pattern, that which is predictable. Cause and effect, fundamentally, if it is tightly correlated, is a form of order. It is order through time. So with this- So one question that I have about this is related to Radigan and the implementation of Golden Order Fundamentalism, and whether or not Hawkshaw thinks Radigan is adding more gold to the pre-existing order of Godfrey and the ancient Erdtree and Erdtree worship type incantation, incantations, which were only based on faith, or because even in that form of the Elden Ring, there were still like the circles and stuff, but the roots were a little bit like less ordered, so to say, than the like straight lines of Golden Order fundamentalism. So I don't necessarily think that you know, is very incompatible with the ideas that Hawkshaw is posting right here. I'm just kind of curious as to what his thoughts about that would be. This, we can establish that order is not only something that applies to things with static states, such as beast blood not rotting. It applies to processes, just as a dam will consistently redirect water in this or that direction over time. The next is Law of Regression. Heals all negative statuses, dispels special effects, and reveals mimicry in all its forms. Regression is the pull of meaning, that all things yearn eternally to converge. This is inverting causality, or removing effect. Any form of order is expensive, and to do this at a deeper level, say a wide area, or deeper into the past, i.e. through more layers of cause and effect, takes a lot of order. It is expensive. 
It is easy to damage order with chaos, but undoing order cleanly backwards is not chaos. It's I get where he's coming from with saying that regression is the inversion of causality. And you could make that argument as to how stasis is kind of being enforced in the lands between through the Elden Ring with that kind of argument. So I, I do enjoy that perspective. And I might want to think about that one more on my own as well. But going back to what some people are saying in chat, Sir Quilinus says they don't really like this idea that gold is actually especially valuable compared to the other colors. It's probably overvalued. You mean gold is associated with the value and power? I can get where you're going through with that. And Chadwick said that they agree and gold isn't order. It's just the golden order and the golden order isn't absolute. So going back to that idea of stasis, I do think it's more of a Radigan type thing. And that could be kind of an institution of order. But I think one thing to consider with Hawkshaw's interpretation of order and gold right here is its compatibility with life and the unresolved question of is gold life or does it just have the capacity to perpetuate it because of things like golden poop re retaining its heat and its customary smell as well as like beast's blood never rotting or decaying and of course the dragon hearts continued uh vivacious beating and all that Radigan represents the pursuit of perfection and the congeniality, pretty sure. No, I mean poop. Golden poop. It is a very hard operation that also requires a lot of order. All incantations are of interest here as well. Immutable shield protects one's own order. Lord's aid and cure poison use a great abundance of order to draw out poisons and ailments from our bodies, and we can see these colours being removed. Finally, we have order healing. All the good and the- Did I mention like- Oh yeah, no, I did mention gold's propensity to contain life. So yeah, I do wonder what Hawkshaw's interpretation of like what the red-tinged gold of the Crucible is in relation to this kind of gold mentioned in like the gold-tinged excrement and all that. The Great Wanted was an absolute evil to contend with. Does such a notion exist in the fundamentals of order? So we get to the moral aspect of order. Who benefits from order? What does benefit even mean without order? Before the existence of order, can we talk about good or evil? Both, if they exist, arise from order. The benefit or harm of a dam, its gain to some, its harm to others, is already placed atop an order. Can something as fundamental as order itself have a morality? After all, with chaos, such things fall down. Melina tells us as such. If you intend to claim the frenzied flame, I ask that you cease. It is not to be meddled with. It is chaos, devouring life and thought unending. However ruined this world has become, however mired in torment and despair, life endures. Births continue. There is beauty in that. Is there not? If you would become Lord, do not deny this notion. Please, leave the frenzied flame alone. Life itself is destroyed in chaos. The pain and suffering of life is also order. It is division and distinguishment. Frenzy removes the order of pain, just as the eye of yellow relieves it. Without suffering of any kind, we would die. Order contains, perhaps irremovably, suffering, but is a mixed quality of life better than none at all. I, I the Lord of Frenzied Flame is- I do want to back up just to kind of try to absorb that a little bit more. No Lord flame alone. Life itself is destroyed in chaos. The pain and suffering of life is also order. It is division and distinguishment. Frenzy removes the order of pain, just as the eye of yellow relieves it. Without suffering of any kind, we would die. Order contains, perhaps irremovably, 
suffering, but is a mixed quality of life better than none at all? And of course there is like the very uh, Buddha saying that life is suffering. The Lord of Frenzied Flame is no lord at all, when the land they preside over is lifeless. Chaos is a release, but a well-structured order may do wonders. And this range of the possibilities of order is the purpose of Gold Mask. The state of the current order is weakening, and disorder has become more present. The fallen leaves tell a story. Gold is fading even small distances from the Erd Tree. Is it because gold is alloyed with something outer, allowing the influence of outer gods? Is it unstable ideology and fickleness that is the problem? Or is it the physical damage done to the Elden Ring that is causing these issues? Gold Mask takes on the task of mending order. His change to fundamental order impacts everything and everyone in the lands between. In fact, the form of order is what defines every ending in Elden Ring. Many orders are possible. Unlike others who create a mending rune, Gold Mask invests incomparable time and thought into his creation. He has likely spent a lifetime to reach his level of understanding. Staring up, through holes in his mask not unlike a pinhole camera, he observes the world. Is the mask splitting colours, so he can analyse their true natures? He seems to care about the fate of the world, beyond his own self-interest. We should be glad for it. It is an enormous responsibility to lay down the order for all others. Order, in a sense, is innately unnatural. Get it wrong, and it may have been better to do nothing. But there are huge benefits to tempering your nature, for yourself and others. This is why Gold Mask's work is all about transcending. The culmination of his work is the Mending Rune of Perfect Order, a rune of transcendental ideology, which will attempt to perfect the Golden Order. Will this allow Vivid Colour to return to the Tarnished and the Lands Between? Gold Mask has achieved something miraculous when his rune starts an Age of Order. Whether it will succeed in the long term though, only time will tell. So I think this kind of comes to like a very, what I would say like, Atlas type of perspective of things where like, if any of you are like familiar with the uh, Shin Megami Tensei series or like Persona or even like uh, their like Tactics Ogre series, which can kind of correlate to uh, Final Fantasy Tactics and all that, that the idea of law and order isn't necessarily linked to good and or evil. And so by having like absolute order, it could imply a complete loss of freedom, which is a very interesting concept or dichotomy to me. And one of the things that I really liked about the early Shin Megami Tensei series, I haven't played five yet or anything like that, but it's still kind of like present in the games. So anyway, um, Drunk Mage, welcome to the chat. And also Howdy, I don't remember if I said hi to you. Uh, you said the Flame of Frenzy ending is a very dark take on Buddhist metaphysics and the denial of dualities such as life and death. Yes, you're absolutely correct with that. And for my uh, April Fool's video about the Frenzied Flame ending, I really uh, dialed up like the Buddhist aspects of saying like, you know, getting rid of pain and getting rid of suffering is, is one step to like Nirvana. But um, yeah, I, I the way that I set up that video was to just kind of like take a certain point of view and conveniently omit all the things that would kind of like contradict it, which is more or less how I feel the three fingers and the adherence of it represent themselves in this game as well. Uh, Elden Enthusiast wonders if Radigan is aware of the one great in some form, if his law of regression describes a yearning to converge, since, friendly, since Frenzy seeks to forcibly rejoin all. Yeah, that's an interesting question and something I haven't considered myself, whether or not America and or Radigan would have known about the one great. I'm kind of personally of the opinion that the one great might not have ever been a thing other than a tool that the three fingers are trying to use to make an unwitting patsy out of the tarnished to institute their control over the Elden Ring and the universe.
<laughs> All right, Junk Mage. Yeah, you enjoy that. I mean, it's it's a very silly video, but uh, presented very, very straight-faced. Gold is colours set in order. We can see it when it breaks and ceases to glow, its colours revealed. Gold can be a shackle, but gold can be freedom. All that is cursed or evil is order, but so too is every gift in life order. To choose its alternative is madness. To know ourselves, our nature, our colours is a path we must follow, just as Goldmask followed his. Never impose order carelessly. Instead, walking this path of understanding may give the insight to harness our own natures, to lay down our own rings. To gain strength of all forms, to be present, to earn comfort with what we cannot control or understand, to be more in harmony. Too much, and you are out of control. Too little, you're ineffective. Too intense, you'll never last. Too light, and you fade away. In time, our actions, thoughts, energy, instincts, and even emotions can be brought to harmony, with time and battle. After all, the creator called gold the concepts of order and discipline. Just as gold I would disagree with that right there, and when you mentioned it the first time, I kind of disagreed, but I think Miyazaki was talking about the Elden Ring specifically, although if you want to make the argument that all gold comes from the Elden Ring, that could be all well and good too, I suppose. Gold won its place in Elden Ring. Anyone can conquer their own lands between. Anyone, even if you feel your colors are tarnished, can transcend to gold. All right, that was a pretty uh, cute and wholesome ending there. I did like the video, even if, you know, obviously I had uh, many small disagreements, which I think is part of the fun of looking at the lore and people who have perspectives that differ from your own. So even though, like I said, there were disagreements, I do feel as though I've gained new perspectives as a byproduct of this, and I will have more to think about. I do like the idea of gold potentially representing order and preserving something as it is in that kind of instantiation of order. I'm not sure if it entirely pans out, but I do really like that in relation to memories being preserved in gold specifically. But of, of course, like one of the hangups is how life can also get imprinted on it and all that other stuff. Um, I did have a couple notes that I'm not sure if I still want to like touch on them right now. But when he was talking about red being related to life and blue being related to spirits, I was a little bit curious as to like how Hawkshaw would reconcile the idea of the spirits being drawn to the blood in cursed blood pots. Whenever you threw them, they would kind of cause the spirits to become frenzied. Um, another idea was how inorganic life seems to be more death adjacent. So things like the Crystallians and blue things, as you would call them, like being more related to spirits. And if they're more inorganic, in my opinion, that could mean they're like a little bit closer to death and then therefore a little bit more naturally more detached. I think I might have had more like concrete thoughts to go along with that, but that's just kind of uh, what I could remember for right now. And then the other thing about yellow and its relation to lightning and chaos well, I get where he's coming from with that. I do wonder what he thinks about the red lightning of the ancient dragons in the uh, ancient dragon cult of Langdell, specifically in relation to that. So, yeah, those are kind of my closing thoughts on the video. I did enjoy it, as I said. If you guys enjoyed it, go ahead and give him a like, a comment, and or a subscribe. I'm sure he'll appreciate it. The link is in the chat. And if you guys do have more videos you want me to react to on stream, go ahead and leave them in like the video comments or join the Discord and leave it in the channel feedback area if you'd please. And yeah, okay. 
I think that'll pretty much conclude the stream here for today. I'm not sure what I want to watch tomorrow yet. I'll figure it out and it'll be like on the alerts and stuff. Maybe like two smaller videos or something like that. Um, yeah. As long as it's taken me to react to some of these other videos, I'm not sure if I'm going to get to this one by TLGTW. That's uh, almost five hours long. It'll be like a 12 hour stream at the rate I go. <laughs> all right. But anyway, that'll be it for me for tonight. So once again, thank you all for joining in. You have a good night. We will be going live again at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time tomorrow. So until then, take care and hopefully we'll see you on the next one. Last protagonist out.